the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Note for the record that all council members are present. Do I have a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? So moved. I, I would, li I would like on. to uh, Roger, yeah, Roger. close in memory of um, four, four citizens who passed away since our last meeting. We have uh, Ray Nowakowski, Ben Hodge, Tommy Gonzalez, and Don Thacker. So I'd like to close in their memory. Thank you, Clark, for mm. doing that. So I'll second. Uh, the agenda. Thank All you. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next on the agenda is oral communications. And that's an opportunity for anyone to talk uh, to the council on a matter that's not on tonight's agenda. And I do have some slips, so I'll go with uh, the slips first. And then if anyone uh, who has not filled out a slip would like to speak before the council, uh, you may, may do so. So first up is Dana Dilworth. Good evening, Dana. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, I wanted to speak about Sierra Point, and I don't know where it would fit um, potentially um, among Mayor Council matters in the workshops that you um, are presently um, considering. Um, I was out there the other day, and I knew Walmart.com was going to leave, and the um, um, the industry publications indicate that they moved to San Bruno for a more energy efficient building and that they had even considered the Myers building along Bayshore but um, selected this other place that is more energy efficient. So I think this is a, a, a red flag in my opinion. Um, but also Sing Tao has left. So there are very few people operating out at Sierra Point. And um, it makes me concerned because of the potential that's out there that's not being utilized. I look at tax records, I realize that they're paying tens of thousands of dollars in taxes but aren't going to be receiving any revenue for their buildings. Um, it's a concern. And earlier when you were working on your um, budget, I spoke with um, Stuart about maybe you haven't added or looked at the impact that the America's Cup could have. I grew up in Newport, Rhode Island that had the America's Cup <laughs> up until it went to San Diego. I, um, they had the Newport Jazz and Folk Festivals that when it became too difficult they sent it to New York City. Um, uh, there seem to be th ways, oh, and, and in Newport, Rhode Island, which I don't think fits here, is they have the horse-drawn carriage week, 
where people go along the esplanade or the 100-mile um, drive, which is along the ocean front, along the mansions in their horse-drawn buggies. But there's, I believe Brisbane could be unique in a way that we draw um, people to Brisbane and have them enjoy it as much as we have available. Um, other ideas would be new flea market. Um, people tell me that the high school in Palo Alto l uh, leases out their um, parking space one day a month for a flea market. The, to me, there seem to be opportunities out there that we're not doing and that we don't have any self-promotion. We don't have somebody looking at, okay, what can we do? Um, also, when I was out there, I noticed that there's some fish migrating, and they get caught in the channel between 101 and um, um, the northwest corner of Sierra Point. And I wondered, what are they? Are they friend or foe? Um, I spoke with a fisherman who said he thought it's actually an invasive yellow smelt, but nobody knows without any kind of study. And so I would suggest that when you're considering options for bringing new revenue into Brisbane, you also add Sierra Point. Um, it would uh, seem that any of, I, I mentioned doing um, um, carnivals, and then somebody said the wind might knock the, the, the um, um, uh, Ferris wheels over, <laughs> but that's why it takes a lot of people to think about it. I am just thinking out loud about things, ways that we could draw people to Brisbane, particularly next summer when America's Cup is going to be here, and when I mentioned it to some people involved, um, they said, oh, well, we're going to paddle boats, boats between Oyster Point and Sierra Point. I really think we need to look at something bigger. I think we will be able to attract a lot of people to the hotels if we have something to offer. So um, just kind of in long and short, um, I would hope that you put some time and effort into um, thinking about possibilities so that we don't miss the America's Cup um, chance. I understand the pier that they were going to use in San Francisco burnt down, but that doesn't phase them. <laughs> they think that they'll do fine, that they'll rebuild the pier before America's Cup comes. That's the mentality of San Francisco. I'm at ta thinking out loud What's the mentality that we can bring to the similar opportunity? And that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, now, you, you brought up a lot of great things, Dana. Uh, economic development out at Sierra Point is, is definitely a key uh, priority for the council and um, something that we'll be addressing uh, going into the next uh, several months, uh, short term. Uh, promotion opportunities, definitely uh, something that we want to capture. Uh, we've been talking with Ted, um, the Harbor Master, uh, about uh, how do we uh, take advantage of America's Cup. And um, we just formed a new subcommittee uh, dealing with uh, the Sierra Point design guidelines, but I'm sure that you know that'll be part of the discussion. We also have an economic development uh, subcommittee, and we'll be talking about that as well. But uh, it sounds like you, you, you'd like to, you know, be able to provide more input, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find a way to, to get the community more involved with that. All right. So um, next is um, Rosanna Wagner regarding uh, the high school transportation option to Westmore. Good evening, Council Members. Good evening. My name is Rosanna Wagner. I live at 231 San Benito Road in Brisbane. And I want to thank you for continuing to fund um, the transportation to Terra Nova and Oceana on behalf of the Jefferson um, High School District. And um, 
I, as a parent of a recent graduate of Westmore High School and an incoming sophomore attending Westmore this fall, I would appreciate your consideration and support in creating a new or expanded route for the Samtrans number 24 bus to include Westmore High this fall. I understand that it's late in the year um, and that may not be a viable option, but um, it's my understanding that there are more students attending Westmore from Brisbane this year than has been in the past. Um, and I just would appreciate your consideration in that. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Rosanna. Uh, before I ask the next person to come up, Clay, um, can you talk a little bit about the Sam Trans bus? Yeah, I did, had a conversation with Sam Trans um, official on Friday. Uh, with regards to the uh, Route 24 and the potential of uh, expanding it to uh, include Westmore. And um, he said that they would uh, take a serious look at that and we're going to set up a time for uh, for me and maybe others to meet with them. Uh, so we're going to try to do that fairly quickly because uh, uh, the time is short. For is, sure. is this it's not a promise, but it's, 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 um, it's a potential. Is this something that me as a TA representative need to be involved work with them? Uh, is this? Yeah, I think that actually, I think having a council person participate would be great. It's a good idea. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks. When, when is our meeting with the um, school subcommittee? Is it this month, isn't it, or this week, or next month? At the August something. With um, the second half of August. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's some, um, uh, okay. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely bring that up, Rosanna. Okay. Stacy Glenn. 16th of August, 5.30 p.m. 16th, okay. Good evening. Hi, council members. I am Stacy Glenn and I live at 2 San Diego Court, Brisbane. Thank you for all you do to, uh, for our community and I hope you will consider my request. My son Patrick will be attending Westmore High School this fall. I am requesting that you consider expanding the current school bus which transports Brisbane's high school children to Terranova and Oceana to include the other district's high school Westmore in its route. This would probably mean changing the course of the route to go up and over Guadalupe Parkway to drop the Westmore students off and then go on to Pacifica. An alternative option may be asking Sam Trans to expand their number 24 school bus that currently picks Brisbane and Bayshore students up and delivers them to Jefferson High School to go a little bit further on up to Westmore High School. I believe that this option should really only be considered after truly assessing the current high school buses situation. In past years, very few Brisbane students have been accepted to Westmore. However, this year we have six incoming freshmen. This figure will double the number to 12 total students from Brisbane. Westmore is actually closer to Brisbane than the other public high schools that Brisbane students generally attend and thanks to requests from our school district and other Brisbane officials and residents, we are hopeful that this school will be more available for Brisbane students in the future. For many obvious reasons, this is a great thing for all of Brisbane as having another good high school option is a win for all involved. The next step is to reinforce this high school option is to provide the same transportation to the school that the other schools have. Additionally, it has been frustrating in the past to have a school in our district that our tax dollars support and is close to us yet has been generally denied to our students. I believe that we need to seize this opportunity now and provide the necessary transportation so as to create the expectation, if not the obligation to Westmore to accept our students if they wish to attend. By having a school bus to Westmore, this should show the Westmore board and our district that we want this school to be an option to our students. I am hopeful that the council will take the time to consider these two options and create a viable transportation solution which benefits all of our children, not just some. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and also, I have... Um, two other letters, one from Jessica Tiatia, who is a resident here in Brisbane and who teaches up at Westmore and has children here, and also from Richard Cutler in support of a solution. Yes. Right. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, Stacy. Clay, you wouldn't by chance know how many students um, attend Oceana. I know most of the kids attend Terra Nova, but how, how many attend? I, I don't have specific yeah. numbers, but we have done some follow-up on this issue with uh, CYO, who is our, our bus operator. So there's two issues with adding Westmore to the route. Um, the first is timing. Um, it will add probably another 10 minutes in the morning um, and um, also have an impact in the afternoon. Um, we're also concerned based on the numbers that we're going to get oversubscribed in terms of um, the number of spaces that are available. And then that creates an issue for us in terms of how we go about selecting who gets uh, gets mm -hmm. on and who doesn't. Um, so it, it's, it's a little more problematic. Um, that's why I'm hopeful that the Sam Trans Route 24 might bear some fruit because okay. uh, I think it's going to be difficult for us to be able to incorporate it into our current bus program. Maximum capacity on the bus is 60? 60, I think. Yeah. R roughly 60, yeah. All right. Yeah, that might be tough. Yeah. It's amazing that we can, we can accommodate the kids today. Yeah, I think we're pretty uh, close to capacity. Um, or I think we were last year pretty close to capacity. I mean, don't we have about 125 students from the school district? That, I guess it's the... Probably, but, but I mean, it tends yeah. to be, you know, freshmen and sophomores, I think, probably predominantly. In the, That's true. Yeah. Right. That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, any other members of the public that would like to come before the council on a matter that's not on tonight's agenda. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, so what's the follow-up plan then? Um, the follow-up uh, will be that we'll um, hopefully get a meeting with Sam Trans in the next, uh, hopefully the next week. Um, and um, if that indeed works, um, then that would probably be the best solution. If it does not seem to work, um, then, you know, um, I think we're going to have to do some further analysis and maybe bring that back to you towards uh, your later meeting in August. I, I realize that school starts earlier than that, um, but it doesn't look like we'd be able to meet that, that time frame. So the, the history to this is that there haven't been many students going to Westmore in the past, and this has now changed. Is that seems to be um, the explanation for the situation? Yeah, it seems to be because we, we normally every year when we meet with a two by two meeting, um, and this year it's got pushed out a little bit later. But normally they give us the kind of the uh, uh, census of where Brisbane students are going. And historically, it's been a very small number that have gone to Westmore, but there certainly seems, based just anecdotally on what people are telling me, that there's um, maybe as many as a dozen or so kids going to Westmore from Brisbane. And the reason? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> I think I think the test scores are are very comparable to Terranova, and, and I, you know, talk with some of the parents, but you know, with what's been going on with the bus issue is is. We inherited this, and you know, we keep saying this over and over that uh, a number of years ago, the city of Brisbane put you know sixty-seven thousand dollars when we were flush with money that would go towards advanced placement classes, computer labs, uh, other classes that were provided, uh, extended library hours at Terranova, but computers for the whole district, you know, for Westmore, Jefferson, Oceana, and Terranova, and a late bus. And over the years, with the cuts that the school's been taking with the state, then the school district, Jefferson Union High School District, came to the city of Brisbane and said, oh, gee, you know, <laughs> we're having trouble funding the bus. And then, uh, what was it, two years ago? Maybe, yeah, two years ago, I think it was, that uh, they said that they could no longer, the Jefferson Union High School District could no longer support the bus, so... City of Brisbane said, well, you know, if that whole pot of money could go towards the bus. And that's kind of how kind of inherited this in a way, you know, that, uh, you know, I mean, really, I, you know, it's not something that we really wanted to provide a bus, but, you know, wanted to provide advanced placement classes. But now it's a matter of getting the kids to school, you know. And so I think parents are seeing that... 
Westmore probably offers some very high academics, as does Oceana, and, and uh, Turnover that's comparable, but it's closer. And, you know, I guess you'd probably have to speak to individual parents as that, but uh, I see even Jefferson High School uh, itself coming up. I mean, one kid just uh, graduated in June, got an appointment to West Point, 4.0 student. You know, and I don't think we've ever had a student <laughs> appointed to West Point out of Jefferson. He's the, actually the first, and so that's uh, a, a good sign. But I think that that might be what's happening here. And judging from what some of the parents are saying, they hope that there is a major shift where kids are not going to turn over. Or parents have a, a tendency to send them more to Westmore, which, you know, kind of makes sense. It's closer. It doesn't make sense. Why are they going all the way over to the coast side, you know? I mean, that's the school that is furthest from any school. And Jefferson's the closest. Westmore is the second closest. Then Oceana and then Terranova. So. I, I work with schools. I, I, that's my job. If I know that there is another source of funding that is going to pay immediately would be the area that I'm going to back out, for sure. Because there's some other person is picking up the cost. State of California totally stopped giving money to schools for transportation. Almost all schools in the state don't get money from um, state. Only special ed gets it. So you find yourself, you're going to end up being in transportation business for schools. We need to bring the schools into this. Bring our um, elementary school, bring the uh, high school district to really have a solution. We can't go year after year. It's August, parents don't know how, how the kids are going to go to school at this time. We're not, uh, we're not quite sure what Samtrans is going to be. This is poor management. Um, this really frustrates, frustrates me. This should be dealt with way, way back. We sit there and then we get this pressure to provide transportation, even though it's nothing to do with city's um, practices. But it's our citizen. This, it's our concern because it's our citizen. So I really think we need to come up with a solution. You can't continue this. Well, I think, you know, that um, in regards to Westmore, looking at the 24, is it 24B? Is that the... the no, it's 24. Oh, okay. Um, might be a, a viable option. I know that uh, spending a lot of time on Bayshore, in the Bayshore district, that there's a lot of kids who catch, uh, catch a bus there you know, in a, a corner of Geneva and uh, Schwerin, and a lot of them do attend Westmore, so I'm not sure if uh, that's a 24 route. You know, some of them go to Jefferson, some of them go to Westmore. So. I, I was quite upset. Samtrans was funding a new shuttle for the, that big, huge building that you see on Bayshore, the empty building, you know, that has been sitting vacant. Yeah. Is that hmm? The Myers building. The Myers building. Yeah. Couple of couple of floors are filled, so guess what? There's a transportation. There's shuttled for that, but I bet when we start talking about this 24 expansion, I bet they're going to come back and give all kinds of excuses. I really want to be on the top of this with them. Clay, isn't, aren't Glad there have. aren't there some kind of restrictions though with with using a public bus? I mean, you, you know about that, right? Isn't using public. Bus yeah, that's yes. a little bit of a head scratch for yes. me. Yeah. I did talk to them on Friday about that, um, and uh, so this it, this sounds very bureaucratic. I mean, there, there, there's sure. there's a technicality as to why this is not considered a school bus, even though if you go on their website, they'll actually refer to it as a uh, a bus to um, you know Jefferson um, or yeah Jefferson High School, and then also um, I think a grammar school. So and they, you know, and they, and the and the the route runs Monday through Friday during the school year only. So how that isn't a school bus, I don't know. But when, anyway, uh, they're saying the federal government, um, and through their lobbying efforts, pre prevented. That's my understanding. Public transportation to become school transportation. Well, that's the, the that the legislators have to change. Legislation has to change to be able to do that. 
There's no doubt. But, but there, there's some term I can't remember exactly what he, he told me. It was something. It was something like a variant or some a variant off the the main route or something. Some kind of bureaucratic term. Yeah. Um, and but I mean, this is you know the walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck, right? I mean, this, this is a, a a school route bus. So you know, if we can meet with them and get them to expand it to take the kids to Westmore, then I think we can accomplish. What, what you know the citizens of Brisbane would like to see happen sure well, let me let me ask this and, and, I, and of course you know I mean this isn't something the city's taken on but I mean we do have our bands our city bands that hold what 12 passengers or something like that um, yeah I mean it's just uh, I'm just looking at an interim type solution that maybe you know that Parents, I, I, we could take a look at it. I, I always get nervous are, about are getting into really? that. Well, just that see, I'm just saying that you know we're we're you know is is this just something to throw out there to kind of look at an option. And and, and I'm not saying that you know it's gonna that we're gonna pay for that. You know, I mean because you know the the way I understand it right now, the way it works is. is, is Students' parents or each student pays three hundred and sixty dollars per year. Right. Well, actually, the the, the number is going to go up based on your your direction to staff. Um, right. You know, but um, okay. Yeah, they, they pay you roughly about a quarter of the cost. Yeah. Roughly. Okay. But that's going to Terra Nova. And Oceania. Yeah. yeah, which is about twice as far as from Brisbane to Westmore. Yeah, that's another issue. Uh, I mean, I, we don't have a differentiated price on this you know you, you pay the same whether you go to Oceana or Terra Nova right right no I no I'm saying Terra Nova is about twice as far from Brisbane yeah. as Westmore is so yeah okay thank you all right any other questions okay comments all right so next on the agenda we have two presentations and the first one is um, yeah, it's a real treat for for all of all of us citizens in Brisbane uh, because uh, tonight we're going to recognize the businesses and individuals who generously uh, provide the funds for us to enjoy the concerts in the park. Uh, before I, I call up the the, the folks to to uh, that I'd like to recognize, I, I first wanted to recognize our park and rec commissioners who are on a subcommittee that chose the bands that will be performing. And uh, the first one, first band, uh, well, let me just mention the commissioners, uh, Commissioner Bolagoff, Dunn, and Fryer. And uh, the first concert is going to be August 24th at 545. And it will be the swing band Stompy Jones. And then we'll be followed by the California Cowboys, the Cocktail Monkeys, the House Rockers, the Hot Rods, <laughs> Uh, a Beatles tribute band, the Sun Kings, and then the last uh, performance will be um, on Sunday, September 30th, and that will be a Brisbane local band, uh, Al Molina. And so, um, yeah, it, it gives me great pleasure to recognize these folks. And so, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to call out the, the the top sponsors, and then uh, when they come up, if they can. Uh, pick up the banner, and he, as you know, I mean, this banner is is uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's uh, um, one of those things that every you know late summer, you know, when that banner goes up, it kind of kind of gets you all excited because uh, you know the warm weather is here, and and it, and it becomes a, f a festive uh, atmosphere in Brisbane. So uh, the platinum sponsors. Uh, Joe Peters and Jonathan Sharfman of Universal Paragon Corporation. So if you guys could come on up, grab either end, <laughs> and then uh, then we'll bring up the other folks, and everyone will, will hold the banner, and we'll do a, a big group uh, photo afterwards. Uh, the gold sponsors. Uh, it's a little heavy. Use your legs now, right? Bend. bend yeah, over. I, I can't oh, do that. Right? Back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have... Uh, Bill uh, Berlich of Byright Food Service Distributors, uh, William Spencer of WF Spencer and Son, Brendan Murphy of Kingdom Pipelines, 
We have uh, John Lignito and Rich Borgello of Recology Sunset Scavenger. <laughs> the silver sponsors, uh, Bill uh, Del Chiaro of Brisbane Hardware and Supply. Doug Ryder of CGS, uh, CSG Consultants Incorporated. The Glasman Schillinger family. Stuart, you going to get on up there? <laughs> Come on, Stu. You know you like the, the limelight. Tamara Heath of Golden State Lumber. Howard Wheeler of Laurel Landscaping. Joe Cow, uh, Joy Cow of Chen Key of California Bakery. Barbara Bernard Bernardini and Paul Formosa of South San Francisco Scavenger. And then we also have uh, our remaining sponsors. We have the Brisbane Chamber of Commerce. I know that Mitch Bull is there in the audience. Dan and Kelly Carter. Linda and Bill Detmer of Detmer Associates. Bob Detmer of Detmer Construction. Alfred Banfield and Raquel Lacroix of Garden Chapel. Manilik, Michael, and Bill Mohan Chida of Integrated Resource, Resources Group. Johnny Neva of John Neva Insurance Company, or Insurance Agency. Julie Banks of Julie's Brisbane Liquor in Delhi. Lori and Ray Liu. Because we can stand up too. Bill Kim of Lewis Raphael, a division of Kizan International. Ron Davis of Ron Davis Real Estate. Sue Cochran of Sue Cochran Construction. And last but not least, Tim Chang and Sons of Humboldt Tree Service. Okay, and then we need to get up. Yeah, you know what, uh, let's see. I know Carolyn wants to do her photo. Yeah. You know what, I don't know if they're going to be able to see all of us. So how about this? Why don't we go we'll <laughs> on each side? We'll see Clark. Oh, want us in the picture? No, we're here. It's okay. on. Yeah, let's go on down. We'll get on each side. Because I don't think it's going to make it unless we get up on the... Uh, <laughs> People see you. Well, no, they won't see us. If we stand up here, that might work. It does sure. work. Yeah, Come on, stand here. It would work here. Come it's here. All right, let's just see if it works. Yes, it works. Come here, it Caroline works. Caroline can tell. Yes. Come on here, we are okay. All right. You stand in front, Cliff. It's okay. Right. Come here, you would work. All right. So you, your body. Hmm? All right. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you so much for making the concert from the park. Uh, Thank you. An annual event. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, All right. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Linda. How you doing? Nice. Good. You. Hey, Bill. Good to see you, man. <laughs> hey, Bill. <laughs> So next on our agenda, we have another presentation. And the next person that we would like to recognize is Robert Maynard. Okay. Well, before he comes, before he comes, I'm supposed to give a little background of what's going on. All right. All right. And then we give the microphone to him for his input from inside. Um, a, a while back, um, a representative of San Carlos 
on the mosquito abatement board realized there was some discrepancy that didn't make sense. This person was very vigilant and very persistent. Come to find out she and others um, opened up a can of worm of major embezzlement. The person, finance director, was very good about hiding things. When Mosquito Abatement hired this individual, um, never did a background check, while the person was under investigation from another fraud case. They were very good about not giving reports to the board, and um, she had a good way of um, hiding things and giving excuses that they really bought. This became really big and came before LAFCO. Um, I've been very outspoken and critical about what has taken place um, where, to an extent that I went and I did a quick management overview and I really think that even though they're in the right place to make some changes, um, I wanted to, I suggested that they should be on probation and after six to eight months this issue to come back and there's a grand jury investigation is going on at the same time and last Wednesday, the, the LAFCO decided to request the mosquito abatement to come before LAFCO and make periodic presentations since they have started making a lot of changes. And if those changes does not materialize, then they can always go back and dissolve the district. But um, we have our very able, wonderful Mr. Maynard, our representative at the board that has finance and envir environmental experience. And I met with him with our, our city manager to get his take on that. And we invited him to come and make a quick presentation before the council. That's good. Could I have just one question before we ask Mr. Maynard to come forward? Um, it's not clear to me how LAFCO ends up in the, in the position of legal jurisdiction over the, La the state of board. LAFCO is conducting ma uh, the service review of all the special districts, all like water, hospital, districts, harbor district, part of this review, that's where LAFCO gets in. Got it. And, and if you could, just, just for the audience and, and those at home, we throw out a lot of acronyms. LAFCO stands for Local Agency Formation Commission. That deals with any city that needs to start, any service that needs to be uh, initiated mosquito water harbor they do the service review and, and if sphere we were, of influence if we were going to incorporate the Corey into Britain Correct. it would have to go through a LAFCO hearing right. yeah right. okay yes mr. Maynard Bob come on up you, you visited us so many times you're like family now <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, honorable members of the council. Uh, I don't have a lot to say, uh, ushering to council member Richardson uh, about this, uh, but except to say that it was the board of trustees' responsibility to assure that the district adequately had uh, adequate financial oversight and that this was unfortunately uh, not done. Um, the uh, district has new financial staff properly vetted and uh, much more carefully overseen than before. It has several new uh, board members on the trustees with much more experience in finance than before. Uh, the, the, there are new auditors, although that doesn't assure that there are no f future frauds uh, that will occur, as some of you may know. Um, and uh, there are new control systems that have been been installed and revert and uh, reviewed by an outside re uh, expert. Uh, that's the beginning of of what the uh, organization has done to uh, address the problems that have occurred in the past. Uh, I know that there's a lot more work to be done 
by the district. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have any questions of me at this point? I thought you were, were retired, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, he actually joined really? more committees. <laughs> Right? You know, You're in the uh, I think he got a little distraction. Yeah. I, I actually, I, actually yeah. was, I, I had been a member of the policy and environmental committees. I have an MBA in finance, uh, but I have a strong interest in the environment. I've been an Audubon Society member for for about 35 years. Uh, I. Uh, decided after this that I should be on the finance committee instead <laughs> with my background. Thank goodness. So uh, I hope I can do some good there. I think you will. I think you'll, you'll bring stability and uh, credibility to uh, that department. I've just, yes. There have been all these letters going back and forth requesting grand jury investigation of the situation and sort of where does all that stand and is the board concerned about that or what? I have a little apology to make. Uh, last time I met here with you, it was in April uh, for the West Nile uh, uh, proclamation. Mm -hmm. And I told you all the good things that were going on with the district, which is all true with the, work the employees. Good. And the, the work is, is still good. Uh, at that time, I, I knew what was happening with the uh, with the district attorney's office, but they told us in, in closed session not to say anything because they were still gathering evidence against the accused, uh, or else I would have said something to the council at that time. Um, so. Um, I uh, should have come before you before that, uh, before now, to uh, talk to you about it. Uh, I apologize for that. That's fine. So where does the grand jury stuff stand? Uh, I, my understanding is that the grand jury said that they were too busy this year. I'm not sure what, what's happening with that. They, they have agreed to have their letter that was sent from San Carlos, City of San Carlos to grand jury. Um, I think the new grand jury is right now in the process of being formed or is formed and they have agreed to take this on. Oh, they have? Okay. Yes. And yes. Uh, I guess that's, that's about it. That's what I understand. Yeah. Now, the wonderful thing about it, the district does a fabulous job in taking care of what they're there to do, mosquito abatement. Dedicated people, wonderful people. It just, it, this fraud was so bad. And very honestly, that some of the cases that I've dealt with in school district, the embezzlement, it's really hard to detect. Uh, one bad apple can totally, so the county has not shown any interest whether they would want to take it over or they don't want to take it over. There are some some recommendations that have been made. Maybe the finances should be done by the county. Maybe hiring practices should be done by county. So what are you really doing? Make this breaking into pieces. And where is the effectiveness? If you have change and monitor and see what's going on, um, the problem was the general manager, there's, people are very critical that the board has temporarily extended the general manager's contract. Uh, you would know that better. Maybe you want to talk about it. There's concern over that because if under your clock something happened, you want to continue managing the organization that you weren't. And he's admitted that finance was in his area of expertise and that's why things happened. But maybe you want to That's, talk about that. Uh, it was decided that uh, he uh, would undergo a, undergo a training period, a retraining period focused on finance mm. to see whether he could be brought up to speed. Uh, and uh, so uh, he wasn't given a new contract. His 
current contract was extended for a certain amount of time and is going to be reviewed in a, in a couple of months. Are you on that committee to... No, I am not. Okay. My concern has been the district has not used purchase order system. Like anybody wants to buy something, they just go buy it. You need to have a purchase order. You need to have work order system. So they've agreed to take my recommendations and implement all of that and see what happens. But would you come back maybe after a few months and again give us an update of what's taking place? Certainly. I'd be happy to. Appreciate that. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> One question for you. Sir? What was, since we've talked about the, the embezzlement, um, what was the anticipated amount of the embezzlement and what kind of time period was it? Over, a, over? over a year and a half, uh, the district attorney is charged uh, that the amount was uh, $450,000. There are additional costs involved in redoing the books uh, and uh, the legal costs. Um, the district uh, does have insurance and hopes to recover a fair amount of the money. It could be up to six, seven hundred thousand. The total cost. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Okay. Next on the agenda <coughs> is the consent calendar. A motion to approve the consent calendar. I'd like to remove a couple of items. Okay. Um, I'd like to short discussion on D and E, uh, and also I'd like to talk about J. J. Okay. Okay, my motion included everything except B, E, and J. D, E, and J. D, E, J. D, D E, J. E is a dog. Yeah. E is a dog. All right, so do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Ray. So the D and E are the monthly investment reports, as uh, Stuart well knows. And I just have, um, I thought it might be useful to um, note that um, between April and May, there's um, quite a difference in the carry value of investment. And I thought maybe it might be helpful for you to explain that. May is a period of time when we start paying our bonds. So... And you're talking about the treasury obligations. Yeah. We use, so the money that's at the, is, that's at the Bank of New York is used in the, from the treasury obligations. A portion of that is used to pay our bond obligations. And we also, the bond obligations of that in May is over one and a half million. I know there's a $1.4 million payment. I think there's another one as well. So we have close to one and a half to $1.6 million worth of bond payments. So they took the 400000 from there. And then we also used money from the general checking account to make the additional payment for the bonds. And you will see one of the big, one of the bonds when you look at your ROPs. So that's the reason why there's a reduction okay. in the carry value. All right. That's good. And then um, my s second question has to do with the timing and what your sense is of when we do the division between the city and the successor agency. <coughs> and we've been talking about that, and I noticed that it's later on on the agenda. And I was just wondering, is it your view that we should just leave things as they are until we have that subsequent discussion or um, I, I, I think we should but also what? right I, I, we should but we also have a separate checking account for the successor agency already uh -huh. um, so we are keeping you know the money is separate it just shows up on this on the overall investment report 
And if you would like, I can show a different in, uh, different report for the successor agency and pull the Bank of America checking account successor agency out of this report and just put it on a separate report if, if you would prefer that. Yeah, well, I was thinking not so much for myself, but for our oversight panel, because they, uh, some members of that panel seem to really pay attention to our materials. And I think uh, it would be helpful for our communication with them to make it clear that we are making those you know, financial distinctions between the city and the successor agency. Okay. It will help us in the long run with legal battles and so forth remains to be seen, but at least we are doing what we can to show that there's a distinction between them. So when you, you probably won't see the change in the June, but for the July investment report, you'll have this uh, successor agency investment report and a city investment report. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, did you want a motion to approve those two investment reports? Then? Uh, we could or we can just do all three. Three? Just, just, just do you have two. J? Just two. D and E. Oh, okay. They said you, you pulled off J. He yeah, did. Well, oh, okay. I haven't okay. talked about J yet. I haven't talked about J yet. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll, I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, J um, is a request that the council pass a resolution of support for an application for funding for a technical study for a candlestick interchange. Um, and I guess I kind of, uh, I didn't know about a lot of this, and so I would like to be informed. Um, there's a, evidently a study ongoing that hasn't been finally completed yet. I kind of like to know what that's about and where it's at, and, and it wasn't clear to me what this additional study is going to do because there's this discussion about, you know, geometric coordination and that nice phrase, but I haven't a clue what it means. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of asking to be educated as to what it is we're asking for and, and what are the, and I'm going to ask later on about some implications, but first I'd just like to know kind of what we're talking about. Sure, sir. Let me, let me take a shot at that. Um, so the study that's been underway, and as with everything in transportation, there's a ton of acronyms. So as part of the project development process, which of course has a project development manual, which is developed by Caltrans, when you begin with a project initiation document, and all three of those have acronyms, the first report that you have to begin if you're going to make capital improvements on the state highway system that Caltrans owns is a project study report. So that is the project that's underway right now. And the project study report is to look at a new and improved candlestick interchange so that you would have on and off access in all four quadrants of that interchange and have adequate capacity in a perpendicular direction to US 101. Uh, at the request of Caltrans, we studied as both an undercrossing and an overcrossing. The project's been going on for about four years now. Uh, as you wade back through the staff report and in the application, which we had to turn in in advance of this meeting because of the dates that, uh, that the Transportation Authority had put on it, there's a rather lengthy discussion of all of the documents and such we've done in there. And I, and I recognize that some of those would not be particularly helpful. I, I'm not sure that, you know, that the to, to look at the geometric assessment drawings uh, w would help you, or to look at the advanced structure studies and stuff. Uh, those are very technical terms that are part of the lexicon of the transportation work. So that project is about 80, 85 percent done. We had a last meeting at the end of May with Caltrans. They had some revisions that they asked us to make. Those were just completed, and I believe although I didn't see it get transmitted, the consultant was to transmit those over to Caltrans um, this week. The, the value of that document really is that once a PSR, the project study report is complete, is it puts the project in a frame or in a path so that it's eligible for funding. So it's eligible for funding for the additional studies that would follow. These studies are actually quite expensive to do. For instance, the project study report, which was completely funded by developer contributions, is nearly a $700,000 study. Uh, it's anticipated that the next phase that we will go into, the project review, will be a $4 million evolution uh, because of the amount of work that's required. So that answers the question about what's been done. Um, and the question about what this is going to do is this. As, as, you, as you, I'm sure, are well 
informed. The Baylands is an incredibly complex area, not only because of the process we're going through, but because of the constraints and restraints surrounding that project. Multiple developments, certainly the Schlage Lock development just immediately to the north of it is tiny compared to everything else going on. When you look at everything that's occurred at Executive Park, when you look at the projects uh, at Candlestick, when you look at Hunter's Point, when you look at the ever-increasing scope of that development area, practically all the way to India and, and China Basin, it's an incredible amount of trips that are moving there every day and there's been a very large number and a complex suite of transportation projects that have been proposed through there. The challenge is that now because of where the interchange is, that's the most restrained project that's out there because it has built development on two sides and it has the bay in the other corner. So those things can't be moved. So we had to fix those corners and we had to fix some of those elevations. As we were doing that, the other transportation projects that are being proposed in that area have also developed further along. You're aware of the uh, the multimodal station study that we're doing in San Francisco. You're aware of the, uh, the bus rapid transit uh, lane that's been proposed by San Francisco. And what this study needs to do now is to ensure that we don't have conflicts between the best alternatives that come out of those studies and where we have presently fixed the candlestick interchange, both its its latitude and longitude, if you will, and its elevation. So that's really the intent of this study. Is to, and, that, and that's what we mean when we say the geometrics of it. We're making sure that, you know, just because when we were doing the study, this looked like the best place for that ramp or that interchange to land, we don't want to discover that, well, geez, if only we had informed ourselves more, if only if we had looked at the other studies, that we didn't prevent their best alternative from happening. So it's really an effort to be as collaborative as we can and to really ensure that modes in addition to the automobile are going to be accommodated the best they can. Two of the other major components, and I, I can't believe I missed them, are pedestrian and bicycle. That's really one of the biggest challenges getting across there right now because if we don't do certain treatments there, it's going to be sort of a wasteland for pedestrians. If we don't do the necessary treatments and incorporate how bicycles get through there now, especially as they come along uh, from the Bay Trail, extend it out of Sierra Point, and then go through any future Baylands development to get them back going east towards Candlestick, again, it's just going to be a dark, dank tunnel, and we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to make bicycling as friendly, as enticing as it can be. So that's the main gist of what we're trying to do here, sir. Okay. That's very helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, a, a couple other things that um, I wanted to ask in reference to the application itself. Sure. Um, on the, I guess it's the first page, but page two of the application, just a couple of things that came to mind as I was reading through this. Um, it says uh, the overview, overall project description. The city of Brisbane proposes to modify and reconstruct. Is it really the case that the city of Brisbane is going to construct the interchange, or are we talking about Caltrain's, or what? Well, the reality is we're presently listed as the project sponsor. So the statement is accurate as it stands in today's world. Uh, I don't think I've gotten myself to the point yet where we know who's going to build it. I don't, I don't know what, what the world is going to look like when we get that far down the line. But it, it's possible, I and mean, we could do that. We could certainly manage a design and a construction team to do that. That would not be the first time that an improvement has been built on a Caltrans system to a Caltrans standard by others and then handed over and ownership turned over to Caltrans. Isn't, isn't it often the case that you know, particularly small jurisdictions let Caltrans do it? Caltrans? Well, I, I don't know that I could give you the odds on it. I, I think the problem that we have with Caltrans is the one that we've seen uh, all too frequently over the last two years, and which has really been part of the reason why the project study report has slowed down, is that Caltrans unfortunately works directly for the governor, and the governor can make line item vetoes in their budget um, based solely on his input. And in our, exact, in our precise case with the PSR, what happened was two years in a row, and two different governors, mind you, first first uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and then first Governor Brown, line item out the oversight budget necessary for them to have staff to review the plans and the design work that we were doing. So, and, and I believe it was before the new council was seated, so we 
ran around and we got some money from the Transportation Authority in San Mateo, we got some money from the San, from the San Francisco Transportation Authority to fund their oversight. So that's why it, it's hard for me to give you a big, strong, convincing, yeah, let's, let's let Caltrans do it. Caltrans certainly has competent staff. Caltrans has certainly built these projects. Um, Caltrans, I don't know how they decide which ones they really want to do and which ones they don't, quite frankly. There are some that they just don't and that they don't show a ton of interest in. So I don't see it as worst case. I think it's just a scenario that we need to be prepared for, that if we're going to be the project sponsor and, and we end up doing that, then, then we end up doing that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just want to express an intuition that taking on such a huge project, you know, a small town, uh, strikes me as... Uh, nerve-wracking uh, and maybe not something we really want to do that's just a personal reaction uh, but we'll see how I mean we're not making that decision now obviously but but the application says the city of Brisbane I just wanted to express right. my concern that I'm not sure we really want to build an interchange uh, so that's just a personal view but, and, and sir and I, and I really would like to respond to that just since I, I need to defend Karen's honor as, as I'm standing here. Karen is our senior civil engineer. She is the capital projects manager for the city. Uh, she just is, is off doing a very fine job having completed a $14 million project over at Tunnel Avenue Bridge. And I think the difference in scale is that it would just require a bigger consultant support team uh, to do that. So I, I don't really see it as that daunting. I, I think it's something that, that, that we could accomplish. It just, and, and I wouldn't be coming to you suggesting that we hire more staff. I would be coming to you suggesting that we do a lot of contracts and Karen would serve in the same role as she served before. She'd be the project manager and she would just have a bigger uh, team of construction managers. Quite frankly, they're usually uh, retired or previous Caltrans employees that have gotten off and, and formed their own businesses doing the work. I'm still leery. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the you know the South City interchange project was a nightmare, uh, and you know these things are really expensive, and, and all the things we are running into with the state, you know, deciding oh you know you don't really need that money after all, or you know what have you. I'm thinking that maybe it's better to have somebody else responsible rather than us, but that's my intuition about it. Of course, the state's usurped it twice now. Right. I think they do things let with the flip of a coin. You know, if they want to yeah. usurp it, let them do it, you know, um, rather than us get stuck holding the bag someplace. So, it, again, it's just an intuitive feeling about concern of, of getting stuck with something we don't want to get stuck with. Um, I noticed that um, in the list of things for the Baylands project, uh, you left off renewable energy. <laughs> Unfortunate. Um, Where is this, sir? There's a list of things here. On, uh, is, there, is there a page on the application? There is Almost a page. Okay. Thank you. On page five. Ah, yes, sir. And City of Spirit Spring is evaluating alternative development proposals, including residential, commercial development, including offices, hotels, mm -hmm. and entertainment facilities. Nothing about renewable energy, nor is the renewable energy alternative even mentioned. So I have an obligation to mention that, as you well know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my apologies, sir, for not noting that. Um, in the list of uh, various kinds of projects, um, it is comes up later, but it isn't mentioned in the you know, things you want to coordinate with. Mm -hmm. and the Slage Lock uh, project is not you know on that list there, where you go through the various kinds of projects that you need to take into account, the Executive Park, the Cow Palace, the Baby Bullet, Bicycle Pedestrian, like you were talking about. Uh, but the Slage Lock is not in that particular list of things. Mm -hmm. It is later on, though. Right. Um, so I assume that... Um, these are just little things that I think I want to you know, demonstrate to Dana who wants to know whether we actually read these things. Uh, I think council does read these things. And so I'm kind of just pointing out that I've read through this and there are a couple of things that I think we, we want to say something about because we don't want to give an implication that we're okay with all this. Um, like policy consistency on page 12. I'm sure this is the way that the Transportation Authority sets it up. but. 
It's called Adopted Plans and Policies. And then underneath that are all kinds of EIRs, and there's also the you know, draft Baylands, Brisbane Baylands Specific Plan EIR, Notice of Preparation. Well, that's not an adopted plan. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to make sure that this is probably following a bureaucratic framework, uh, but, you know, these are not adopted plans. Um, on page uh, 13, uh, maybe I'm not, th there's on E, there's no reference to sustainability and not applicable to this application. Um, I guess in my view, if you're improving transportation and you got bicycle and pedestrians, and et cetera, et cetera, that's certainly a part of sustainability. So I guess from my point of view, there is a statement to be made about sustainability, not rather than not applicable. That's just my reaction anyway. Uh, then on the same page, 12, uh, 13, uh, the leverage matching funds. The, the table there doesn't make sense because there's 100% at the bottom, but everything is zero. So I'm guessing that measure A should be the 400,000 there in that table. Am I right about that? That's correct, sir. Okay. Um, then there's a, another statement that uh, concerns me, and that's on page 14, uh, where you're talking about uh, community opinion. And they ask you if there's any concern about the Baylands project or the interchange or the Geneva Avenue extension or what have you. And the answer is, well, there has been extensive public outreach has been completed as part of the Bi-County Transportation Study and a strong level of interest has been verified. Well, from my point of view, that's pretty misleading. Um, <laughs> there's certainly a lot of interest in this project, and not all of it is all that positive. And I'm aware, I mean, I was in the Transportation Authority, and I'm aware of the fact that we're trying to sell a bill of goods here. I mean, I know the, the, the game. Uh, but I also think uh, we have to pay, you know, there are some of our citizens who actually read these things and want to know, is that what the council is buying into? Um, well, well, sir, I think we're mixing applications here, though. This is not an application for, to support the Baylands. This is an application to support geometric design studies for the transportation The overall project, projects. and it's the interchange. That, that's, I, I'm sorry, sorry. Just, and it's, uh, I, I respect your opinion. Attention, right? This is a study application, sir. It's not, right. the da it's not the development of the Baylands itself. No, 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 but this is a part of it. In my mind, anyway. I mean, if you're going to build uh, the whole thing, the Geneva Valley Extension, this is an uh, interchange. This is a part of the Baylands Project. The Baylands Project doesn't happen without this. To me, they're integrated. Understood, sir. Uh, maybe you can separate them out in your mind, um, and uh, maybe there's an engineering way of separating it out. But in my mind, it doesn't separate out. Uh, they're interrelated. And I think we need to uh, recognize that these are all part of a you know, of a broader program of potential development, which we may or may not engage in. In fact, one of the things I wanted to, you know, we're trying to get this money, we want to study, and it makes sense. So I got no problem with that, and I have no problem with the resolution. Um, but I do think that we need to be clear about, just because we're going for this, that doesn't mean this is necessarily going to happen. Uh, you know, the Geneva Avenue extension and the uh, Interchange or you know, and all the whole bimodal transportation. I mean, it's just incredibly expensive. As I recall, it was a half a billion dollars. I mean, it's quite conceivable that none of this happens because it's too damn expensive. They don't have any way to fund it. Uh, so you know, we need to, to to have some awareness of of that reality, and you know that, I know that. Um, but I think we just need to make clear that we're preparing for something that may happen or it may not happen. Uh, and in order for it to happen, you need to do the studies. I understand that. Y yes, sir, and, and, and I'm sure you're well aware that these projects were recommended for placement into the countywide regional transportation plans by people before me. And so we, we thought that we were just continuing the You might be interested city's position in knowing that the person who put this in the Measure A transportation plan in the first place was Ray Miller. Sir. Back in 1988. 
So I'm very aware, much aware of this project that I supported it and I got it into the Measure A plan because I was a part of the team that put that plan together. Um, but things have changed. You know, redevelopment agency's gone away. Um, the whole kind of project that we're talking about may not be feasible. The, the amount of money that they're talking about for this is incredible. Uh, we may want to do a totally different kind of approach. We may not even want to build the Geneva Avenue extension and the interchange. I mean, back in those days, I thought it was such an obvious, wonderful thing to do. But, you know, it just may not be feasible anymore. And so I think we just have to keep that in mind when we when we deal with, uh, you know, the Baylands as a, a very significant, important project. So I'm sorry to go on about that, but uh, it caught my attention and I wanted to express my views. So I appreciate your listening and responding. Thank you for sharing, sir. Thank you. I appreciate hearing your comments. All right. So having on. said that, uh, well, I said that was okay with the resolution because we're, oh. we're supporting a, a request for money t to do a study, which you know, makes sense <laughs> only as a, as a preparing for something that may or may not happen. Right. Okay, I'm all right with that. Okay. But we ought to be clear about what we're saying and what the implications are and um, the fact that there may be other alternative ways of approaching this so we don't want to get stuck in one line of thinking. I guess that's what I'm concerned about. Okay. All right, so I have a second? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Ray. Great comments. Thank you, Ray. All right. Nice to take those trips down his history lane sometimes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Public hearing. Find where I know. Let me just grab my. There we go. All right. Next on the agenda. Public hearing, consider resolution number 2012-16, overruling protests and ordering the improvements and confirming the diagram and assessment for fiscal year 2011-2012 for the Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. Staff report, please. Mayor, members of the council, you've previously had two items before you directing preparation of the engineer's report and preliminary approval of that report and I talked a little bit about what the Sierra Point lighting and landscaping assessments do pay for the lighting and landscaping improvements along the streets and along the paths that are on the perimeter of the bay and, and adjacent to the streets so, so you're aware of the project this process is to finally approve those assessments and there are a series of steps that begin with an opening statement to be read by the mayor, unless there are any other questions for me. Okay. Any questions for, for staff? No. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. So this is a public hearing. Is there anybody? Um, oh, there, there's specific. Specific way to one? yeah, sp oh, okay. specific way that this you has to, to happen. You have yeah. to have a statement there. Yeah. You have to have a reader statement. Uh, okay. uh, opening statement. Okay, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> Still uh, new at my job. <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird law that you have to do. Yeah, yeah. Really this is weird. as we do you this every year. Yeah. It's very formal. Yeah. Very formal. Oh. Mm. Okay, uh, this is the time and place set for hearing on the engineer's report and the levy and collection of the proposed assessment for the fiscal year 2012-2013 for the Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. These proceedings were undertaken pursu pursuant to the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972. The engineer's report prepared by the engineer of work consists of the proposed improvements, the boundaries of the assessment district, and any zones therein. The proposed diagram the estimate of cost thereof, and the proposed assessments upon accessible lots and parcels of land within the district. Any one of these items may be the subject of protests or endorsements. You are, you are asked to clearly identify yourself and the property owned by you so that your statements may be correctly recorded. 
The hearing is declared open, and I will ask the city clerk to report on the various notices given in connection with the hearing. Notices have been mailed and posted as required by the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972. Proofs of mailing and posting are on file in my office. A copy of the engineer's report prepared by the engineer of work was filed in my office on June 11, 2012 and has been open to public inspection since that time. Okay. All right. So next in the, the order of procedures and actions, we open up the public hearing. So uh, we'll take uh, oral testimony and comments. So is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak? You can raise your hand and come on up to the podium. There is no one. Motion to close public Second. hearing. Okay. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any discussion by the uh, council? Motion to adopt resolution number 2012-16. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, the next item under public hearings, consider adoption of resolution number 2012-17. Imposing charges for the funding, the local Brisbane stormwater program, authorizing placement of said charges on the 2012-13 county tax roll, and authorizing the county tax collector to collect such charges. Report, Mr. Mayor, Member Tim, Council Members, good evening again. Thank you. This is the item that I really thought I was going to have the most questions on, so we'll see how this one turns out for me. Uh, th th this is by far one of the, the more confusing items. We've been doing this um, since just a few years after the Porter Cologne Act passed in 1987 and uh, even though I've only been here 11 years every time I come back I have to reread the thing and figure out w what has happened between the conflagration and the, the combination of federal and state laws but l let me see if I can if I can try and make it simple for you so there are really two pieces of funding in San Mateo County so that we can take care of our national pollutant discharge elimination system requirements under the different permits we have. The one is called the countywide program, which is taken by the county directly off people's property tax bills. There's a subcomponent of that, which is called the, the, uh, the extra portion, the, uh, I'm sorry, it's the additional fees program. Ever since the county tried to impose the additional fees, Brisbane is one of the handful of cities that decided we were going to pay that and not charge our citizens for it. So that is the county piece of the program. The item that's before you tonight is the local Brisbane stormwater program. That is the program that we run so that we can complete the permit, we can do the inspections and everything that we need. Part of the challenge that you, that you are seeing in my staff report is that the fees have been unchanged for well over a decade perhaps dating back to when we started doing it in the early 90s. So the amount that we are charging for an R1 parcel, about $10, we don't collect enough money even to cover what we report as our local program. We, we report our local program as having an $83,000 budget, and the action that we're asking you to approve tonight is only going to collect $54,000. So we have a deficit there. The problem, though, is that our overall program, which is what you see in our department, 4026, the NIPTES department, includes salaries. And those salaries are not included in here. And we had really gotten to the point where because of the increasing requirements of the, per of the permit, that was a full-time job. And the full-time job was held by an associate civil engineer that worked here, and we were also selling him his services down to the county. And so he was doing about a job and a half. But then as the permit requirements for everybody got so big, the county, CCAG, realized that we can't do this without a full-time engineer. And by the way, we really like this guy who's been a temp here for us. So they hired him. They offered him a better salary, and they hired him. Um, that didn't mean that we stopped doing it. That didn't mean that we don't stop having responsibilities. So if you dig deep into 4026, you will see that 25% of my time is allocated there. And that's about how much time that I really do spend on these permits now. That That's the amount of effort it takes. You'll find that there's 30% of the public works inspector's time in there, and you'll find there's 50% of an office assistant's time in there. And so that 130-something thousand dollars in salaries is real money. So I'm gonna, what we're asking the council to do tonight is to approve the same fees that have been in effect for over a decade so that we can get 
this minimal amount of money. One of the other things that I was going to ask you to do was to consider whether you wanted to give staff any direction on how to overcome that shortage. Because to do that, to increase these fees, you would have to go through a Proposition 218 process. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm happy to take your comments on that, but about three days after I wrote this staff report, I went to a meeting down at CCAG and found out that CCAG is putting out a request for proposals for a consultant to do a countywide study for a countywide possibly recommended Prop 218 to cover exactly these types of issues that we might or might not be a part of. So I'm happy to take uh, any, any guidance that you'd, you'd like to give me this evening, but my recommendation to you having just discovered that information is that we wait and that we see what happens. I think number one, trying to go through a Prop 218 can be a challenging process, but I think to do it as part of an overall county program where all 21 of the agencies that, that work within this county and that have permit requirements are going together and saying that we all really have this need, I think it would be more successful. I think it's a more compelling story. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions or I'm happy to have the council approve resolutions or provide guidance. Any questions for staff? Uh, Terry? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you say that these this is just to legitimize or to collect the amount that we've already been charging? To collect the same amount that we charged last year and the year before that and the year before that. Okay, so right. this isn't an increase in fee increase. That's correct, ma'am. It is absolutely not an this increase. This is a continuation of the existing fees for the stormwater Yes, ma'am, exactly. Pollution. Yes, ma'am. And the reason we have to do this every year is because this fee is collected by the county on the tax rolls, so we need a resolution that authorizes them to do that. Um, I have one question on the um, parcel designations on page two. Um, and the Condo Association at the Ridge, the, the three different associations, how are they put into these designations? I'm going to have to get back to you on that, ma'am, because what we actually use a consultant that prepares a database that's taken from the county and given to us. I can't answer that direct question right now. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, a, a suggestion and uh, an opinion. You know, I have lots of opinions that you see. Um, in the resolution, um, maybe in the, la the next to last, oh, let's see, one, two, three, the third whereas up, the one that says, Whereas said local Brisbane stormwater program has been submitted to mm -hmm. the city council pursuant to the 2012 engineer's report, blah, 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 which includes mandated tasks and associated costs. Mm -hmm. Could we put the actual amount in there? Would be a problem with that? Which, as I understand it, is 53926 Am I right about that? Based on the parcel moving. Yes. So it's a moving target. Is the that's problem what we're too. asking for right now, right? Well, that's an estimate. As these estimate. data, as, as the databases are, are manipulated, maybe we should say, you know, estimated to be the, 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 or something like that. <coughs> we could you say know, estimated. Does, the, the, I think we could say estimated to be. Sense of, sure. The reason I say that yeah. is that um, it's clear we're spending a hell of a lot more on this than we're recovering. Sure. And the whole policy of the council has been, you know, to recover right. when there's a means of doing so. Uh, and clearly we aren't. I mean, we're really right. a, a pretty small percentage of as the actual cost, as you you know pointed out. Uh, and if we continue doing it, it's going to get worse and worse. And, and we don't have any choice. This is a federal mandate. Right. Uh, and, and if there is a way to recover, and it doesn't seem like it's you know it seems like a very fair way to to recover the cost. You know, and then I personally would be in in favor of you know pursuing the the Prop 218 thing, and you know whatever we need to do to you know to, right. to get a, a better rate of recovery. Uh, but I was thinking that maybe we should sort of be more explicit in our actual resolution about you know the amounts we're talking about. 
or at least the estimated amounts. So I don't have any concern if it's the council's pleasure when, when you choose to make a motion. If that's you want us to put an estimated clause in there, I'll, I'll find some appropriate language and put that in there. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm okay with that. Okay. Hey, Randy, um, uh, and Ray, uh, before I ask my question, can you pass me the picture, please? Oh, of course. <laughs> that would be uh, all right, glad to do that. Sorry, we didn't mean to monopolize it. Sure. So, R Randy, that that CCAG option. Um, so, uh, if, if that went before the voters, do they, is it based on a percentage um, per city? I mean, how, how does how, how would that that work out so that we could recoup? Uh, Sure could be, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, well, because we haven't done the study yet, right? So I think that's certainly one of the things you'd want to do is okay. we haven't really even got to the point yet of, you know, could one city charge more than the other? Because that's been part of the problem is that the cities have done it not in a terribly concerted fashion. We're all subject to the same requirements, but those aren't all imposed in the exact same fashion. And for instance, there are some agencies that have um, riparian creeks going right through their quarters that are living creeks. So they have a completely different situation with those. That's not a requirement we have to deal with. There are some agencies that have um, high levels of PCBs or mercuries or things, you know, from past practices, past evolutions that have happened. They're having to work on those cleanups. We don't have that, those issues. So some cities are spending, even proportionally, based on how much bigger they are than we are, incredible orders of magnitudes more than, than than we ever would. So that's one of the things we would have to work out. When do you think that study would be available? Or when it would be finished, approximately? I don't believe that they've even taken that to the CCAG board yet. They just took it. I was I sit on their technical advisory committee, and that was last week, and so it's, show, it's supposed to be the next board meeting, I thought. Right. What do you think, is that right, uh, Chuck? Clark, you think it's going to see the light of day? Uh, is that something that oh yeah, I think I think the board would probably approve the study, you know, for sure. Um, I had a question about that about the uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, maybe in our audience, but you know, we got a lot of viewers, and I don't know what you're talking about in the uh, Proposition 218 process. So maybe you can explain a little bit about that so we understand what uh, maybe maybe coming down the pike. I'm not sure if I want to do that or if I want to ask Hal. Hal, you want to take a shot at uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, Jarvis versus but, but the attorney Linus? Uh, Prop 218 is one of the latest of a long series of uh, state ballot measures that impose requirements on a city's ability to levy fees and charge, uh, you know, increase taxes and the like. Uh, in this context, when we're dealing with assessments, uh, there are special requirements if it's a property-related type of fee or, or a fee that's, that's charged for any kind of a service. Uh, the minimal thing that you would, you would have to do is, is at least a public hearing with notice mailed out to everybody. In some cases, certain types of fees actually are required to go on the ballot for voter approval. I guess part of the discussion, there's been a lot of discussion over this particular fee as to whether uh, well, let me put it this way: for for water and sewer, there's there's a less onerous process, and uh, there's some discussion as to whether any of these fees could fit into that category. But I think any part of the study CCAG does will will look at not only amounts but also process. At the very minimum, we would be looking at uh, some approval of a fee schedule by the council, and then a notice going out to virtually everybody and essentially you would conduct a protest hearing. Now if it takes a lot of protest to reverse it, you'd have to have almost a majority protest. But nevertheless, it's a process and it is an additional expense. And before uh, 218, you didn't have to do, you would simply adopt a resolution, increase the fee and you're done. So with 218, you have to do that, and, and in the worst case scenario, for some types of fees, you actually have to, uh, to get a voter approval of it. And I, I'm not sure this would fall into that category, but clearly there would be additional procedures that would have to be followed. 
the voter approval is majority or two thirds? It's majority. Majority. Two thirds only applies if you're dealing with a special tax. Right. Mm -hmm. And 218 was intended to close the loophole. What happened was when when Prop 13 was adopted, that required voter approval of certain types of taxes, and a two thirds vote on special taxes. What cities did is what used to be a tax became a fee. So a lot of services, uh, the, the cities kind of routinely started uh, trying to collect through fee-based charges and because fees were not specifically covered. Then there were a series of initiatives, including 218, that tried to plug that gap by also requiring either voter approval or at least some kind of a notice and protest procedure, even on fees. And on property-related fees, it was it was even you know more of more of a requirement. So, um, and this would probably fall into the category of a property-related fee. Okay. Uh, good, it, Randy. I'm I'm sure you probably don't know this, but if if we were to implement um, <coughs> the fee to the community, <coughs> to the to, to the town. Um, you're talking about the 218 fee, an increase, yes, sir. Huh? Yeah, what what kind of increase in <coughs> property tax would one expect to pay? It would, it, it, it would triple. Varied, it, it, it would, but, but triple. I mean, what kind of percentage? I mean, like or triple, factor of three. Okay. Well, we're charging, you know, for residential. If you're charging 10 bucks now, and we're collecting 53,000, and we want to get 160,000. I, I don't know that that's that's you know off the off the cuff. That's I, I haven't gone through and tried to split out how many of each different type of property descriptions we have, but roughly that's what I think it would be. So if it's ten bucks now, it'd be thirty bucks. Thirty bucks for a single family home, approximately. Approximately, that's right. That's nine forty eight right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one other point I wanted to make: the irony in this particular context yeah. is that state law requires us to go through certain procedures when it's a prop. 218 type of a fee. Federal law doesn't give us a choice as to whether we implement these programs or not. Right. So, you know, these are something, it's not saying, well, we're, we'll avoid that cost by not doing the, the project. We, we don't have a choice on that to comply with federal law. We have to do these things, and it's strictly a matter of cost recovery. And, and for many years, the city has, has paid a lot of these costs out of the general fund. <coughs> Uh, but now they're increasing to the point where you, know, you simply have to do something. But it's not like we have any choice in this matter. It's, it's, they're all mandates under the Clean Water Act and other federal legislation that, that we have to do. Okay. For single-family homes, is 25 percent of the total fee. Total fee. That's, that's where we collect about 25 percent. It's a little more. 25 percent. 25% of the overall of the money collected. Money the collected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, single family okay. residents. All right. So uh, do I have a motion? I make a motion for both. So we'll uh, approve the wait resolution. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The modification that we agreed to? Cool. Well, we haven't done the public hearing yet. Is there a public hearing? Oh, so we yes. Yeah. We, you can open a public hearing, yes, please. Oh, we don't? So as we do. No, you, you do. Please, sir. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. All right. Okay. Make a motion to approve uh, to open a public hearing. Oh. Hearing. Yeah. We don't need a motion for that. No. But uh, is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on this matter? Anyone? No. Okay. A motion to close public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. But now I can make a motion to approve <laughs> resolution. Okay. 2012-17. Right. All right. I'll second. second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Mayor Lentz, so, so with your permission, could I cycle back to the to the earlier item, the previous item on there? I, I want to amend my testimony there. Because Mr. Miller asked me a question, and I was really embarrassed that I, I thought I'd forgotten to put it in there, because I, I know there's a particular item you wanted, sir. And on, uh, on page three of the simplified application form, the second sentence from the end, and I, I apologize because I couldn't find it when you were asking me earlier, but it uh, it talks about a project limit. It's also owned by UBC. The project property known as the Brisbane Baylands encompasses approximately 684 acres and, and is presently completing an EIR studying the development of parks, retail, commercial office space, research and development facilities, renewable energy generation, a hotel convention center, and residential. So I, 
I, I probably didn't put it in the place where you would have reasonably been looking for it, but I, I did try and get it in there, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good show. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You made good, uh, Randy. <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Partially. <laughs> yeah, take what you can. All right, under new business, item A, consider approval of the charter boat agreement between the city and John Stahl, DBA Spirit of Sacramento, at the Brisbane Marina. Ted Stafford. Oh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. <clears throat> Our first go around with America's Cup, I'm happy to say, is this proposal before you. Um, we were approached by John Stahl, the owner and operator of Spirit of Sacramento. It's an 85-foot by 27-foot paddle wheel river boat that holds 270 passengers. Um, <clears throat> all the necessary documentation has been verified, such as U.S. Coast Guard certificate of inspection, uh, their captain's license, their insurance, and covering the hull, dock, and liability coverage. Um, if approved by the City Council, the Charter will also enter into a berthing license agreement as well as the Charter Boat Agreement before you, which covers other things and behaviors with respect to um, having berthing privileges in Brisbane Marina. Um, the Charter Boat Agreement was crafted using usual and customary requirements of similar charter boat operators throughout the state of California. This is something that you may remember I've done in the past. We've been here before with other charter operators. Um, and one of the things that we have done in the past that, that I hadn't reported to council in prior uh, meetings was Hornblower and Spirit of San Francisco. Um, over the years have come out and we're interested in establishing a business at Brisbane Marina but we're unable to either simply because of the size of the vessel, uh, the market cap that they were looking for, the marketization of their passengers, um, the amenities that we either had or lacked, um, those sort of things. Um, both Spirit of San Francisco and Hornblower were really looking for that part of the bay and that, this was previous to the recession and they went away. As you well know, San Francisco Bay Boat Cruises back in 2007, prior to the recession, uh, was approved for a charter agreement in um, Brisbane Marina, and subsequently they violated that agreement, and the city attorney terminated the agreement, and um, I revoked their berthing privileges, which was also the second part of that, which was the berthing license agreement and the charter boat agreement. So they had two, and they were revoked. Um, back in 2009, you may recall, uh, particularly the, the, the um, former council members that are here, that um, one of our yacht owners, Grant Gilliam, <clears throat> wanted to start a boat, start a charter business with his own yacht on Dock One, and he wanted to call himself Golden Gate Charters LLC. Um, he had a very good marketing plan. He had done his homework. He had our approval to move ahead. We requested your approval to move ahead. And unfortunately, the recession got deeper and deeper and deeper, and he simply went away. He just hit the boat still in Brisbane Marina. Um, his charter agreement has since expired, and he has not uh, made any effort to revitalize that business. Um, Spirit of Sacramento s simply came to us recently uh, requesting that they be allowed to operate in Brisbane Marina, anticipating the America's Cup. Um, one of the things I was um, concerned about was the size of the vessel being able to operate in Brisbane Marina. And so I allowed them to give a trial charter run on July the 4th. And what they didn't know at the time was that I asked one of our berth renters, Carl Gillette, who I've known for a number of years, who's had a berth in the marina, is a very active boater, if he wouldn't mind going aboard the boat, being one of the charter passengers and observe the operations of the captain and the crew because I was very concerned that a large vessel in a small area, you know, the ability to maneuver under all conditions is going to be a, a real test to whether or not they could do it with paying passengers on board. And he reported back to me that he thought they did a, a stellar job and the captain and the crew communicating and anticipating the conditions <laughs> of the air. And uh, uh, anyway, the trial proved to be successful. Um, one of the things that we are also doing that I that I did was um, I did another survey of marine operators that have these kinds of vessels in their 
in their marinas, and there's not a lot of them. So, I mean, San Francisco Bay and Southern California are two of the primary markets for these kinds of things. And in your appendix shows what usual operators require in terms of revenue to those agencies. Um, and it's usually birth rent, landing fees, and either 5 to 10% of gross receipts. Um, I like the Berkeley model because the Berkeley model charged a per passenger uh, fee. And quite frankly, I don't have the resources or the personnel to audit these sorts of things. And so in um, negotiating with Mr. Stahl, the, uh, the uh, operator of the vessel, I kind of wanted to figure out where his break-even point was. And I quite frankly decided that uh, about a $200 per per voyage fee would be fair and equitable given that he's not going to always fill the boat to capacity with 270 passengers. As a matter of fact, on July the 4th, he got about 168 passengers, which is, I won't give away any proprietary stuff, but it's pretty, it's pretty close to where he needs to be in order to operate the vessel. So uh, based on that, I extrapolated a concession fee of $200 per voyage uh, and or event. And then given the fact that he would be berthing on the end of dock two, taking up a significant amount of the navigable channel there, um, I took our current usual customary in tie fee, which is $6.02 per foot, and I times that times one and a half, figuring he's taken up that amount of square footage on the water, he should be paying for that amount of square footage on the water. So instead of paying what would normally be $595 a month for the entai, he would be paying 900, I'm sorry, $893 per month for the entai. That would be static from month to month, that would not change. Um, obviously, the concession fee is based on the number of trips that he's able to book and the amount of activity that he's, he's going to be getting from his marketing efforts. Um, additionally, the fee is there to help offset um, not only as a, as a benefit to the city, but to offset the cost of the utilities such as water and sewage, parking, um, use of my staff. Hopefully, they don't have to go clean up litter and stuff, but, you know, it's, my, it's going to have an impact on my staff, and so I wanted to make sure that we we're going to cover those costs as well with respect to this enterprise. Um, it was also discussed with the city manager today. This is a three-year contract that we're entering into, and Clay suggested that with the advent of the America's Cup and the, the activity level that will be hitting all of the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, I spoke to the Port of San Francisco today, and they, they've... They've entertained several charter boats that want to get landing applications and landing permits from them. And they were talking about, you know, we know that when the cup is going to get here, we're going to be revising those upward because the boats will be filled. Uh, there will be an impact on the facilities. And the Port of San Francisco, you know, wants to get some profit off of allowing that sort of activity to occur. So with that conversation the conversation with the city manager, um, we thought that maybe you might want to consider allowing this to be a, maybe a one-year agreement and then coming back uh, in a year from now and re-looking at, at the fees and, and seeing where the level of activity is and perhaps negotiating with Mr. Stahl you know, a, another fee schedule. So you, you have the right to do that in tonight's hearing. Um, it was just a discussion that came up later on, uh, yeah, on, on the, in this regard. Um, now... Mr. Stahl is in the audience here, and he's prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I've done some due diligence, and I've done some checking. Um, this Spirit of Sacramento operated out of Sacramento Mar Marina for, for a number of years, and um, I think believe they were on the verge of bankruptcy, and Mr. Stahl can, can address that. Um, the, the, the customer perspective on how well that charter did prior to Mr. Stahl purchasing that company was that it was a business in decline. Um, they had a lot of negative um, Yelp comments. Now, I know that Yelp, anybody can post anything they want on Yelp or, or Yahoo services and that kind of thing. And even on the uh, city of Sacramento's Parks and Rec site, there were some comments about the fact that the people were saying it's, it's really not a good value for the money. Since he took over that business, it's gone 180 degrees in the other direction. And um, there was reports from you know the new operators showing very good hospitality sense, professionalism, um, and, and showing people a, really a good time on the water that they normally wouldn't have. Um, there's no other way for me to really measure that uh, 
other than other than what I can find out there. So um, I'm available for any questions, and Mr. Stahl is here as well for any questions. And our recommendation is to approve this um, only because we're bringing a charter boat into Brisbane Marina and that we hope it's good for the citizens of Brisbane and we hope that it's good for uh, the fiscal side of, of, of the marina operation as well. All right, thank you, Ted. Um, Terry, I, I, Terry, is that is that the boat? Remember last week we were having a conversation? Uh, no, that was, that was a different boat that came in oh. last week. Oh, okay. Um, Spirit of San, um, Sacramento has been docked out um, for a couple months, and um, I do have some questions about it, but that was a separate boat that came in for a different charter I oh. go yeah. first, uh, last week. Um, I'm glad that I'd be happier having a shorter term on the on the agreement to begin with. Um, I did get some feedback when the boat was uh, getting ready for their 4th of July trip from some of the other boaters in the marina where they were idling their diesel engines for several hours. It was loud, it was noisy, and I think that those issues need to be addressed for the current people um, that are, are um, have their boats there. Um, another concern that I've heard from other boaters is seeing around the vessel um, because it's so tall coming out of their out of their dock area they can't see around to see if there's another vessel coming in and so even with I think they're maybe a little bit more concerned about other sailboats because even unless it's a really big sailboat, their masts aren't clearing the 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 um, the height the height, the height uh, bridge. of the spirit of Sacramento. Um, I think it's great that we want to vitalize and and get people or get businesses out to the marina and do what we can. Um, are we a PVA? Member, Passenger Vehicle Association, uh, Passenger Vessel Association. Vessel. No, we're not. That that's actually a trade association, um, much like the California Association of Harbor Masters is a trade association. Um, members join basically for self promotion and also, um, you know, watching what's going on at the state level as far as legislation and that kind of thing. And they're there to kind of protect the interests of the vessel type operators of mm -hmm. these larger vessels. Mm -hmm. So it's really a trade organization. Um, because I I saw a um, decision or a discussion from the San Mateo County Harbor District mm -hmm. that was on March 12th of this year um, where I believe this same boat was applying to come into their harbor and uh, use it for berthing. And at that time, and, and their transcripts could be wrong, but they were talking about the safety, because of the size of this vehicle, of this vessel, um, that they had special um, <clears throat> security and special inspections from the Coast Guard that they needed to um, comply with because of the amount of people that were going to be on that boat. And so if... if when we get to that point, if he can discuss, or if you know I of those. That. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because of the size of the vessel, because of the number of the passengers, they have to have what's called a certificate of inspection. And that's where the Coast Guard actually goes on board the boat. They measure the height of the lifelines. They look at the engine capacity. They look at the tip rate, how many I mean, America is probably the best country when it comes to vessel safety in this regard um, because they don't just look at the vessel and sign off on a permit. They show up and they want to look at it. It'd be like a mechanic coming and looking at your car and going through it and giving, saying, well, you've got to fix this, this, or this, and we're not going to give you a license unless you do that. Um, so they get on board and they do a lot of loading tests. Um, they look at the operation. They look at their oil spill responses. They look at their sewage responses. Um, and they have to have these kinds of plans on, on board the vessels for that very thing. Um, I happened to speak to Peter Grinnell, who's the general manager of San Mateo County Harbor District. And without going through a long, convoluted story about who said what, at, at the end of the day, the, the, the Harbor Commission gave them the permit 
But what Peter indicated was they didn't want to pay for the deposit and they didn't want to pay for the fees. And so basically it became a permit that is inactive. Um, right. So it was it was presented, but it, it, they considered it inactive. And what they were proposing there was simply to do landings, um, much like what the Empress did when they came into Brisbane on Tuesday night. Um, I, I knew Empress was coming. He called me on sort of short notice. He'd been in once before in the last 10 years. And usually what I could require from these guys to, to make sure that the city is, is covered is I want their current COI or um, certificate of inspection to make sure that it, it's current with the Coast Guard, their captain's license and, and their insurances because, um, you know, the captain is, is is responsible for the ship and its passengers from, you know, not only just when it's on board, but also when they're embarking and disembarking. And so mm -hmm. I made sure we had that, and then I also charged them a landing fee as well. Um, only because this was a one time <coughs> deal, um, we didn't need to go through a lot of administrative stuff uh, with respect to, to Clay and the county, <coughs> but Excuse because me. this boat's going to be berthed here and because they want to do, you know, charters out of our marine on an ongoing basis, you know, the charter boat agreement I think is, is really key. And if you, if you read through it, it says things like they, they have to have personnel available for guests. They have to monitor the guests for no drinking, eating, or littering. Um, you know, they have to escort them back and forth. Um, there, there's certain requirements in here that were I didn't dream up. <laughs> they were they were carved from other agreements that were, that were written by the, the other agencies that you see in your appendix. That sent me their their agreements. Does that answer your question? Um, that answers that part of the question. Um, although, um, again, I sort of got a different uh, reading from while the uh, agreement was agreed to by the Harbor District. I think there it, it was a little more. Um, it, yeah, you know, if you want to come on, well, you know, how about this? Let, let's let's finish uh, with the staff, and, and then we'll have you come on up. Okay. Um, so, at that, um, I guess I'll I'll bring that up when when the applicant comes, or the. Um, so when. When they go to, to land passengers, they're going to want to be up at the guest dock. I, I would prefer possible. them to be at the guest dock simply because there's better control of crowded people coming onto a dock and disembarking them off a dock. Um, they're going to be berthing at the end of dock, too. Um, I recognize that that's a very windy area, and there's going to be, on the 4th of July charter, they asked that they could board from dock two, and I wanted them to escort the passengers down so that people weren't wandering around berths and looking at people's boats and whatnot, so that we maintain the security and the privacy of the berth renters that are already there. Um, and we hope to not have to do that all the time, but it is something that I recognize they may have to do, uh, given the wind situation. Um, <clears throat> clearly, if they can get to the guest dock, that's that's the best place to control a crowd of people because it's a very short walk to the gangway and get them off the dock behind a closed gate. Okay. Um, right now, I notice that they are at the guest dock prior to, um, I'm not sure when their next trip out is, um, but... Not until you approve it. <laughs> this is all contingent upon you approving. If you don't approve this, they can't take any more trips. Oh, okay. Well, I thought that they were at the dock in preparation, at the guest dock in preparation for another event. Um, because not, they're not at the end tie, they're down at the guest dock They, right they can go back and forth to either area. I like them at the guest dock also because they're sort of an, an attractive curiosity you know, and, okay. I, and I think it would be good for them to be there because people can see the boat and be okay. curious about it. If they're at the guest dock, will they still have their own electric meter? Um, no, they won't. Okay, because yeah, they're they only have all the lit up. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking big and big and fancy. Um, so I, I would like to make sure that we don't have the boat idling more than we need to. I know that's okay. a necessary yeah. um, part of operations is, is running your engines, but I know that that was very disruptive before their last for some of the other boaters. And um, 
that's okay. I made note of that first staff. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions for Ted? All right, Clark. I have one for Ted. Ted, um, the beam. How 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 wide? Twenty seven feet. Twenty seven feet in. <clears throat> it's a big box. Yeah. Eighty five by twenty seven. So so uh, if it is on dock two, how far away from the seawall is it when it's? We've probably built? got seventy feet of to the seawall, maybe a little bit more. From clearly two b vessels passing port to port can pass safely. Um, I was moving boats down for the. Um, the lean sale auction that we had uh, this this past weekend, we moved seven to the guest dock, and I was going back and forth all day long moving these mm -hmm. things. And I thought, you know, you have kind of a clear shot if you look down the channel, and it kind of lines up with the uh, with the big pirate ship, and it also lines up with the uh, um, the Argosy Venture, Argosy, which is yeah. the biggest boat in, in right, the marina. Right. And so it does stick out a bit, but it's 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 not a hazard to navigation, I would say. But it is some concern because it does have such a big visual footprint out there. Right. That you kind of want to be careful when you're going around it. Yeah, and yeah, there's not a, a yeah, it is pretty monolithic, so I get Terry's concern on that. Um, part she brought up about the guest dock not being on its own meter and uh, lighting it up. And, display and stuff so we kind of have to monitor really what the usage is there I mean if we're going to do like a one-year contract because <laughs> you know the amount of electricity that's being used and everybody else is paying paying their way so we kind of have to figure out how that would be fair and equitable to you know while it's birthed so I, I think that's probably a, a, a real legitimate point <clears throat> Um, perhaps what I can do is, <clears throat> once he's there on dock two for a while, because it's going to be usual customary operations, figure out what his average monthly use is, and then when he moves over to the guest dock, maybe backfill that as, a, as, a, as another f fee or, a, or an addendum to his electrical fee. Mm. That's something we, I think we could probably do. Yeah. yeah. What about if you have the <coughs> electricity usage before he gets there, and after he's there, after a month, the difference between before and after that can really give you a good indication. Mm -hmm. well, it depends on how much you use it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I really don't know. Um, That's a good way of doing it, though. I mean, I know that most of the, the boats that are docked have a minimal energy impact because they're not running all sorts of stuff. Um, and I have no idea what stuff he would be running on his boat. Um, when it's not in operation, but I've see, I see the, it lit up, and so I I don't know, again, what the impact really would be. Yeah. Not low water. Yeah, definitely more than just the, the little sailboat out there. For definitely sure. more than the simple battery charger. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that there's a few generators of some sort yeah. on it. I think We're, it would be substantial. <clears throat> I really do believe that. Oh, we can get that number. Yes. Any other questions for Ted? Um, so we're doing this as a private contract with uh, Mr. Stahl. Yes. And now the other name, Branson Bay LLC, came up, that's and Virgin that's Marine that's Group. Yeah, that's the name of his company. Um, <clears throat> in the past, the uh, city attorney can maybe speak to this. Um, when we had another LLC applying as a charter boat operator, um, city attorney can... Correct me if I'm wrong, but we wanted it to be in the name of the individual so that we're making the agreement with the individual and not some entity yes. to hide behind. Okay. Yes. And is, is and this may be something for um, the individual, is Branson Bay and Virgin Marine Group affiliated with the Virgin Atlantic, Virgin America, Virgin... I don't know the Virgin answer to that question, ma'am. Virgin, everybody. There's a lot of virgins out there. Uh, yes, uh, but the between the Branson and the Virgin, I'm just wondering if it is a connection for a, for a larger organization. And then I did have a question on the um, liquor license and the serving of liquor. Um, I show I the the last um, public notice on the liquor license was that it was applied for and pending. And I don't know if he's intending to serve liquor or what his regulations are, if it's only when he's out, when it's passengers, and what that um, situation is with the liquor license yeah. and 
I, I think I'll have to defer to Mr. Small. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, you know, I wanted to follow up on, on, on Terry's <coughs> question. Um, you know, could the boat, you know, besides being a charter, could it also serve as a restaurant or as a nightclub? You know, sure. Okay. Sure. If that's something that the council had. Yeah, okay. yeah in, in the agreement so also, the re regarding the liquor, in the agreement, um, <coughs> he has to be in... He, he has to abide by all the DRAM laws, and what the DRAM laws are means about addresses alcohol, people consuming alcohol and being covered for it, which means you have to have <clears throat> proper insurance, you have to have the, all the necessary permits and that kind of thing. So ABC he would be in violation of that if he didn't have those. Okay. Um, I, I do have a follow-up, and I'm sorry to go back on it, but I think the 2 a.m., Operation 8 to 2 a.m. is is pretty late for a quiet marina like ours, and I do have. Um, I want to make sure that we really do have passenger safety when they're uh, not so much when they're getting on board, but when they're getting on board, mm -hmm. I think it could run into a, a a problem with getting people. Make sure that we have a one to one, one person off the boat, one person on shore. You you can amend that if you'd like. I mean, I and somehow I'd like to see that. Yeah. It, it, it was sort of usual and customary of other bigger operators that have operate in places like Long Beach. Um, you know, San Francisco Bay Hornblower out of mm -hmm. Berkeley is, is a huge, huge operation. Oh, yeah. You know, and they, they do back-to-back -back dinner cruises sometimes where they do an early seating and they do a later seating, um, basically to cir circle the bay and capture them. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when they're coming off the boat at 1 o'clock, 2 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> Uh, and they're they're going along the dock. Um, is there any type of railing that keeps them in place from? No, they have to be escorted. They have to be escorted. Have okay, to be escorted. and that and that's that's part of uh, right. what's in the agreement. Okay, Terry, you, you're talking about a one one to one. I just want no, no. I just want to make sure that we have a a, a body count, a people count coming off the boat and exiting. You know, when we when they go through our security gate that they're on that other side of that gate. If they brought 200 <coughs> on board, we want to make sure they're putting 200 back on shore. Clicker. Uh, somehow. Yeah. And I, and I don't think it should be up to city staff to regulate that. I think it needs to be, um, but it, it may need to be, depending on how many people or what their context of their cruises are, because I think it's really important for safety, especially if they're at the end of dock two, and that's a long walk, and I mean, anybody who's done that in the evening um, after dark knows that it doesn't take much to trip on an uneven piece of wood, and somebody's in the water, and that could be really dangerous, because just because there's someone else there doesn't mean they can get them out of the water, because yeah. it's hard to get somebody out of the water there. Those docks are, are difficult. So, you know, I, I have those safety concerns with, with having a high number of Possibly intoxicated people. <laughs> yeah, I thought we don't mind them. Just want to make sure that they're safe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Ted, yeah. uh, how many other paddle boats are in the bay? <clears throat> After the uh, 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 Do we have the, you know, all the competition? You know, there's the there's Delta two. And there's two large ones at Berkeley. <clears throat> There is a large one at South Beach. Um, the Berkeley Port of San Francisco has two. And in addition to that, I don't have a full count of them because um, some of their operations are changing and they're dynamic. Um, but it seems like um, from within the bay, we're probably going to see additional boats coming possibly from Southern California during the America's Cup. Um, they'll probably be coming in and asking for landing uh, uh, privileges. Um, quite frankly, in talking to Peter Grinnell and in talking to other harbor masters, we don't have a lot of room for any more boats, yeah. quite frankly, and particularly the ones of the size like this. Um, the Empress that came in last week actually is on the agenda for the San Mateo County Harbor District for a landing um, at Oyster Point, uh, but he keeps the boat in Sausalito because Oyster Point, there's no berth large enough for him to dock there to stay there. 
Um, <laughs> we're lucky that we have large end ties and that we can accommodate boats that are 100 feet. Mm. Um, we're, beyond South Beach, there's kind of no other place for Spirit of Sacramento um, to really berth that isn't already taken by another boat. Mm. Uh, the estuary in Oakland and Jack London Square has availability there. Not to diss Oakland, but it's just not a desirable lo lo location for charter boat operators to want to be. No, no diss taken. Can, yeah. can I make a comment on the Empress coming in the other night? Yeah. Um, they were lost. <laughs> they didn't know where they were going. Well, he, he was supposed to go to the guest dock, and from his bridge, he saw the... Um, impounded boats that I was going to raffle off on Saturday and he thought that the guest dock was filled and so he was looking for an alternative. What he didn't know is I left him a hundred feet on the south end that he couldn't see from the bridge through all the mass in the boats and so he thought he'd just pull into a slip. Um, well, unfortunately my, my staffer Dave who's my maintenance guy was there cleaning up those boats and he went over and said what are you, what are you doing over here and he said well I'm here to board passengers. And he said why don't you go to the guest dock and he says well the guest dock looks full. And so Dave said, all right, let's just board him here, because i, I got to get back to work. So. Well, I mean, he came in, he saw the spirit of Sacramento and kept going past there thinking he would find something further down. Um, then he backed up, then he went in and he found a spot to pull in. Um, I guess he was lost then. He, he was <laughs> lost, and it was a somewhat of a comedy of errors to see it, because, I mean, it was a big boat. Um and thank God it wasn't windy because I could have seen it, it could have been an issue. Yeah. If he had gotten lost in the wrong area. Yeah. He, that boat's as big as the Spirit of, of San Francisco. Which it it, lo it doesn't look as big just because it's not as square. Um, it's sportier. <clears throat> um, but luckily it wasn't a windy night and everything was good in that respect. But. It was interesting to not have it to have a boat that big sort of lost in the marina um, or appearing lost like what is he doing here? I mean granted we had the hundred people standing out there in the parking lot waiting to get on but um, it was it was entertaining and if it had been a windy night it could have been very difficult. Mm then I would have been really glad that we had the insurance coverage that I got from him prior to that. Oh, because that boat could have, I mean, would just yeah. take everything out as, exactly. as any of those big kind boats of can. Kind back on what, what Terry's saying, and, then, and you mentioned it too, uh, uh, Ted, about, you know, the, the trial run. The captain did a really good job. Do, do, do we need a, a, a pretty skilled captain to be able to manage <laughs> this, this boat? And Absolutely. I, and, and then how, how do we make sure that, that we always have a really good captain being well, I think I'll let Mr. Stahl. Okay, that, that, you're right, okay. Um, I have a question for <coughs> city attorney. Actually, Hal, have you, you reviewed this? Yes, I did. I just noticed that the copy in your packet doesn't have my signature, but I have reviewed it. Oh, okay. I was going to mention that. All right, thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Make sure. All right. Well, why don't we uh, have the applicant come before us, Mr. Stahl? Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ted. Good evening, Mr. Stahl. Good evening. I um, I'm here to defend my vessel from a few um, comments that were made. We'll start with the captains. They have over 1,400 hours in Sacramento since 1995. Brian Cooper and Mark Cagle are top captains. They're currently working part-time for Hornblower when they don't work for me. Mm -hmm. When I have other businesses involved, they're working professionally both in Pier 39 and at Old Sac on Hornblower vessels. And Mark came in in 15 knot winds. I think that is probably the most severe winds we will ever encounter. That was the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. We don't go into this area at these late hours. That was a proviso that the 2 o'clock proviso was in case of emergencies that come up where we are delayed from disembarking from another location. But in most cases, we would in 
being no later than 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the evening. We came in at 10.45 on the 4th of July in 15 knot winds. We disembarked the entire group. My crew walked down the dock. I have seven employees that are shareholders in my corporation, and they were spotted on the dock up to the gate, and Good. they were safely taken off the boat. The group that was hoistered up at the two dock was put in a group and walked down to the vessel at 7 o'clock in mass, and they were all monitored as they walked to the boat. And I am fully cognizant of the liability of this area and of the other boaters, and I'm cognizant of their rights. So I was aware of that. Um, as to Peter Grinnell and working with him at Oyster Point. That is an unsecured dock. I have a K-boat I have a responsibility to fulfill with the Coast Guard. Any vessel over 149 requires certain security issues. Brilliantly lit lights, unfortunately, are one of them. My lower dock has to be lit at night. I pay dearly for it, but it's required by the Coast Guard. The uh, dock at Oyster Point in front of the harbor's master's office is an unsecured dock. There is no gate there. So that nexes my ability to use that dock. And that is the reason I withdrew my application and for no other reason. Thank you. No, no, I just, when I was reading it, the part about the PVA had I'm a had member of the confused. PVA and that's important because we do consider all of the municipalities and areas that we work with. I've been a member for two years and my vessels are all registered with the PVA. Well, good. I, I appreciate the the um, clarification because it had sort of put the PVA and the Coast Guard in the same paragraph for what I had read. So so that was confusing to me, which is why I asked the questions, and I appreciate the Certainly. clarification. Certainly. Um, any other comments or questions you might have? I, you know, I just want to clarify. So you have seven crew members and one yes, captain? Yes, we have. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I do not sail my vessel without two 100-ton captains. That's an extraordinary expense, but it's for safety. Because of the size and the scope of my vessel, I have three wheels. I have a central conning wheel, and I have one on the port and starboard side. Mm -hmm. My captains are on both wheels at all times upon docking. <coughs> that is a safety factor and it precludes, it's required in my insurance, and I have two captains that are certified, and that's above and beyond. That captain that brought the Empress in was a single captain, ma'am, and if he had a second captain, he wouldn't have made that mistake. It's that simple. That other captain would have been on the radio. He would have been at the navigational system, but when you put a vessel at the wheel of a captain, he has an extraordinary amount of pressure to secure the boat's direction, and he does not have time for navigation. And that is the issue that you encountered with the Empress. And I, it, it bodes poorly upon our industry to get that kind of comment about the Empress, believe me. So, is it two captains and yes, seven other? Yes, sir, 100-ton captains, certified. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and seven other employees, or seven? The two of them are captains. The other five are oh. employees. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they work kind of the deck and... We have deck deckhands. We have uh, two female staff, and we have uh, basically a safety officer. We have a security officer who's 6'2", 220 pounds, and uh, he is professional. And uh, I'm very pleased with uh, Paul's demeanor. He's, for a, for a man his size, he's very diplomatic. And so we've had no issues with any of our eight charters to date. We began our first charter on the 11th of February of this year. The vessel was in a dry dock at Bay Ship for a year, having improvements, uh, interior, exterior, hall improvements done at, at a great expense. And we are here with the idea of the America's Cup generating our extraordinary opportunities. I have a second vessel in Sacramento, and I have a vessel down in Newport Beach called the Spirit of Newport. And so this isn't the only vessel, but we're all very excited about the America's Cup. So, so how many uh, trips do you plan on taking, like, on a monthly basis? Then uh, uh, we, we have the America's Cup preliminary trials coming up in August, and we have six racing days. Mm -hmm. In October, we have five racing days. 
And in the interim, I have a professional marketing organization that procures weddings, retirement parties, uh, school outings, just the entire gambit. And we market aggressively into the marketplace with this vessel. We have a 262 capacity with a crew of 12. So we have a 274 overall capacity for the vessel. So you want to get it out as much as possible, of course. Uh, we do. We um we also know that in this environment with the recession that there are I was I just went to Newport Beach last weekend and there are probably 50 percent of the vessels at the dock I'd say a third of those are in bankruptcy and it's really a shame to see the sheriff's certificates on these vessels but the recession's taken a big toll sure we came into the game late uh, as to your question about affiliations with the Branson Group, he has an option to purchase 49% of my vessel's stock, Branson Bay, and he has not exercised that option yet because I have not performed on my intent, which is to develop at least three vessels for the America's Cup. So, given that uh, you want to take tours when the America's Cup comes, you want to take people out there, Yes. and you have to dark uh, dock in specific areas or you know we, they, they really are the the um, restrict area them. that I will be escorting folks to will be west of Treasure Island and we'll be departing at 11 o'clock in the morning on these racing days mm -hmm. and we'll be returning uh, at 5 in the evening from the west side of Treasure Island and mm -hmm. this marina at Brisbane I was blessed to run into Ted and and he seemed to understand my position and the, the proximity of your peer. This is a very politically oriented area for dock space. I am not an old timer, but I feel like it sometimes. I have attempted to get into dock space in San Francisco at the port. I've done everything I can to lobby. It's very difficult. And when I discussed my needs with Ted, he seemed to think that we could work something out. Mm -hmm. And I told him the scope of my operation and I do appreciate all the work that he's done definitely so on the west side of Treasure Island uh, what, what do you do we would stand anchor? off we if you were to drop anchor then as the tide came and uh, as, as it ebbed and flowed you would be taking people out that would be in close proximity so we virtually have to hover for six hours oh and uh, yeah, hover in place with running. a GPS at approximately 100 yards to the west of Treasure Island. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then we, we would pro progress, yeah, a great deal of fuel. Yeah. yeah. Great deal Sadly of fuel. The, we, yeah. we carry, we carry uh, thousands and thousands of gallons of fuel. Yeah. And we have our own generator, which is what another issue that came up. We generate our own power um, at the dock when we have events. Uh, we do that an hour prior to uh, departure. I wish I could cut it down, but it is just one hour, and I'm cognizant of the noise that that would create. Um, they're always um, shut off immediately upon safe arrival, uh, and, and everyone's exiting. Those generators run the lights. All our light systems uh, have to be on when our parties depart so that they have safe issues and safe exits. As soon as they depart, we shut down. We go into shore power at that point. And the, I could answer that question also. Um, each slip has a canister, has a meter mm -hmm. in front of it, and that meter is recorded. There is a uh, meter in front of the area that I would prefer to be at, which is as far to the south as possible on the guest dock as not to intrude on any of the other boaters. So there is a standard in front of me, and we could take a reading on that and take a reading uh, at the end of the month, and I would be more than willing to pay everything commensurate with that uh, power usage. I have no control. I do have to have the bottom lights on, and that would be for the possibility of any intrusions on the boat. Yeah. That is a secure gate. Only boat owners that have already been vetted by Ted are allowed on that dock and their guests, and that is what the Coast Guard would secure. They would not allow me to land at Oyster Point because that was an unsecured gate. So anyone could come on at any time. So that was a situation there. Thank you. It's quite educational. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah.
And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come before you tonight to discuss what my needs are. I hope that uh, you recognize that the Radisson Hotel and I have been in discussions about bundling airfare into the Radisson and onto the vessel and then out to the spectator grounds. I have a vessel with a 250 capacity. There are 50 racing days. That's 12,000 tickets. My tickets are $129 each, and that's roughly $1.5 million. I have a second ship that I would love to bring in here if we can work out something between Brisbane and myself. I have a second ship that would bring an additional 6,000 tickets and bring that up to 2 million. And if you have thought of, I've heard a lot of your needs here in the city today. And if you realize these are people coming from all over Northern California, all over the world to view one of the premier races, I am not against levying uh, on those tickets a reasonable fee for Brisbane and the city and some of their needs. So I just wanted to leave that thought with you. Uh, as you were saying, I was thinking about the same thing. I know you were. I could read it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Any, with there, yeah. any other comments? Uh, any other no, thank questions? you. Thank you for uh, your <laughs> forthrightness. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any members of the community that would like to speak about this matter? Sure. Come on up. Uh, you can come you. to the podium. Mm -hmm. And if you could state your name, too, and, and where you live. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Larry Job. Uh, We've had a boat in Brisbane Marina for 19 years. Uh, we had the opportunity of going out on the Spirit of Sacramento on 4th of July. Very nice time. Very professional. He birthed, his captains birthed the boat. Very, very professional. The only thing that I could really see, and I talked to the harbor master about it, when you get 160 some odd people intoxicated or semi-intoxicated and they're walking down that long dock on two and the docks in Brisbane from being 25 years have the tendency to wobble up and down. <coughs> There's a great chance of somebody tripping or falling into the water. The guest dock is actually the best spot for the spirit of St. Louis to be. Sacramento. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, <laughs> I said that was Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Spirit of Sacramento. Um, that is the best spot for it to be, really. Uh, on um, Dock 2, it's entirely too far. And uh, that was about it. We had a great time. And we're looking forward to uh, New Year's. That's it. All right. <laughs> All right. Anybody else out in the audience? We should put a donation for the foundation. Okay. All right. Council discussion. Well, I mean, we talked about um, taking our uh, thought up about doing this for a year, and then. Uh, Taking a look at it a year from now. When, when is the America's Cup? Is it August of 2013? Mm-hmm. And um, we also talked about paying for the electricity and figuring out what the cost may be on that. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else uh, from safety Talk perspective? About the, yeah, well, that's right. Okay, so safety. But I wanted to know about the pier that he was talking about, Pier 2 versus... Pier 2 is at the end... No, I know, but, but he was suggesting not to put it on that. He was suggesting that we do it on a guest dock, which guest is, you know, dock, where right. the pump pump is on, on right. dock 1? Right. Is that, that right? Yeah. That, yeah. Right. Where it's right at the end of there and there's a big large area there that's blank and it's and it's kind of in the forefront of the marina and it's uh, very viewable and is that what you're recommending Ted for uh, getting on and off the boat yeah excuse me again Mr. Mayor um yeah as I said the preferable location for him to load and disembark passengers is on the guest dock but 
he recognized it on some days when it's very, very windy. If he hasn't moved the boat over there already, he needs to do it from dock two, which happened on 4th of July. Um, hopefully the, the, the captains get more accustomed to using the guest dock and figure out, you know, boats like all things, you get a better feel for it in an area where you've never navigated before. You start getting a little more confidence that, that they can use a guest dock. Certainly from my perspective, the preferable location is the guest dock. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably because of the close proximity. It's really a lot wider than what it really looks. Yeah, know? it's I mean, 280 feet long, so yeah. it's got a lot of room. Once we get the boats out of there, there's a lot of room for him to maneuver yeah. around. You sell the boats? Yes, we did. And, and Ted, would, would your preference for the boat to be there um, at the guest dock for all his birthing needs or just for when he's embarking or disembarking? Well, there's times when we have cruise-ins for the Yacht Club, <clears throat> and he and I discussed that, that he can't use the guest dock all the time. It's a good spot for him because people walk along the pathway taking lunch during nice days um, from the from the buildings at Sierra Point. You know, he'll attract new customers being there because it, it will be the curiosity. But when we have cruise-ins from other Yacht Clubs, uh, he can't be there. Um, we have other kinds of activities that may be occurring at the, at the Yacht Club that would require the guest dock, and we may not want him there on certain days. So, okay. you know. But for the most part, I think the, the guest dock is a good spot for them, both from a marketing perspective and certainly for boarding and safety. Uh, that, uh, oh, I agree for the boarding and safety. Yeah. The, the longer the dock, the higher the fall risk. Yeah, and it's also closest to the gangway. It's closer to the parking lot. I mean, there's a lot of preferred reasons why the guest dock works better. Yeah. Also for him controlling his, his passengers on board. They don't have to walk you know, a, a long distance to get off the, the lock gate. It's just right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, one thought actually got generated by Mr. Stahl's last <laughs> remark, um, and that is some kind of per ticket fee or something. I guess I'm sort of looking at the staff over there as well as you. Um, you had said that the Berkeley model for you know charging, which is a per passenger plus percentage of receipts or something like that, would better. But then there was <coughs> a bookkeeping problem. Bookkeeping problem, yeah. Uh, but if we but if we sort of move in the direction of his suggestion, some kind of, you know, per ticket thing, then it would be a consistent approach, right? Well, we'd have to have staff to monitor and audit that and look at his books right. and take his head count. So the question is, does, you know, does all that make sense? It's, it's a question. It makes sense to me, certainly, yeah. yeah. Right. And it's usual and customary in, in the industry that they, they do that. They do a percentage of, of gross, um, or in Berkeley's particular case they do a head count right right so is that worth something investigating as a as an option for us to look at or certainly or what certainly I base the concession fee that, that's in the, the current agreement sort of on an average of what he might take out um, knowing somewhat where his break-even point is knowing that the boat's not always going to go out to capacity at least certainly not this year um, you know, given the 4th of July, he didn't get to capacity, so I wanted to have something that um, was fair and something that he could afford, but also made sense for us, so it made sense for the city. And so that's why I arrived at the $200 figure. <clears throat> if he can get to 200 passengers at a, at a buck ahead, you know, we're good. Um, yeah, I have a question for Hal and Andy Stewart, too. Um, so if, uh, you know, sometimes when... Uh, yeah, I might uh, buy a ticket to go to the movies or I'll, I'll uh, buy an entry into a running race <clears throat> and there'll be a, 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 sometimes there's a tax or a handling fee. Is, is that something that the city could, could apply to these? these uh, the tickets? problem is that it starts looking like a general tax. Okay. And if it's a general tax, we would need voter approval. 218. Um, yeah, I mean, we're back where we stand. Yeah, um, okay. It's kind of like, uh, a, like the parking out at, uh, uh, for Candlestick, isn't it? We kind of were looking at... Yeah. You took like a that. donation. You took a donation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, if it's a fee, you have to show that it's somehow related to the service being provided by the city, which in this case is purely a revenue measure. Yeah. Um, there, there. He is required to get a business license. The business license, uh, defer to Stewart, but is probably calculated on the basis of gross receipts. So, there will be some uh, receipts by the city based on his revenue. Now, 
I would assume we would probably get a, a higher amount by setting up some kind of a ticket tax. But in the same way that we're talking about a special, uh, an additional business license fee on, for example, recycle establishments, um, same concept. Now that one did go to the voters and was approved. So, but but we still had to go through that process to put that that fee in place. Okay. All right. But well, you know, I definitely think it's something we can discuss maybe uh, at the economic sub subcommittee <laughs> level. And and then come back uh, to the council with that. It, it's well, not it, a bad idea to have something like that in place. I mean, we, it'd be good to have some specific, you know, uh, example that uh, to which it would be applied. But you know, kind of thinking ahead to uh, the Baylands, if there's some kind of an entertainment facility out there, uh, it'd be kind of handy to have some kind of an enter tax on tickets for an entertainment venue, and then we can define entertainment rather broadly, but at least giving the council the option to implement it if the opportunity <coughs> presents itself. Yeah, no, that sounds like a good idea. Okay. That, that, that's a separate thing, though, to, from, from what this is. So, um, any other... So that'd be something to look at down the line here, then, and so we'd look at keeping it at the $200 per voyage, and then Tighten that up in the next year here if uh, we decide to move forward. Well, it That's, sounds like yeah. yeah right. No, I seem, you know, I mean, it's like you want to get kind of, want it to get we, going. We want to get it going, and yeah. we want it to you know kind of like to be successful, it, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. I like the boat. I, sorry, you have to come forward, but otherwise it doesn't get on TV. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, the the crux of the America's Cup begins in. July of 2013, uh -huh. and I propose that I come back to you before that, a few weeks before that, to review this. And at that point, uh, I'll have an idea of the amount of tickets that I will be able to procure for my ship, and I would be willing to put a levy on. We're talking about international and uh, Northern California visitors that are quite well healed that will be looking at these races. And I would be willing to set a fee uh, at that point per ticket. And that's what I wanted to address. The, I think Ted brought up the fact that these are, are more pedestrian charters right. up to that point. But at that point, then the America's the Cup, yeah. yes, it does. And if we discuss this at that time, I, we could levy a, a five to ten dollar fee per person, and those that, that's all doable. And I'm I'm very amendable to that. So please consider it. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be great. Hmm. Um, I like that idea. I also like that he's teaming up with. Uh, Radisson. Yes. Mm -hmm. The yeah, airfare and everything and making it a package. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's is it still called the Radisson? Right now it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's what the sign says. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they haven't rebranded yet. Yeah, okay. So I'd like to make a motion to approve. So we want to change on page four the term of the agreement so one to one, one year, right? Mm -hmm. That's, yep. Yeah. And we'll also throw in some kind of language about paying for electricity instead of yes. energy right. for determining based on usage. Right. Okay. So um, I amend my motion to include them those, those changes. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, consider a request for waiver of fee and use of food trucks by the West Coast Farmers Market Association. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Cliff. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. As you know, the farmer's market has been enjoyed by the Brisbane community for the past approximately three months, having launched on April 12th of this year. Prior to that launch, a license agreement between the City and West Coast Farmers Market Association was approved, and part of that uh, license agreement had the uh, weekly rental fee of $200 specified in there. That is one of the reasons why we are back before you tonight. Um, on 
July 5th, Jerry Lamy, Executive Director of West Coast Farmers Market Association, submitted a letter to the city, and a lot of it was the concern of the weather. Um, the wind has, the extreme wind has resulted in a lot of broken tents that the vendors have had to pay to have replaced, and what I think is due to the low foot traffic as well. Nine vendors have pulled out from the market since the in its inception on April um, the 12th, though a couple of other vendors have been able to be substituted in from Jerry's other markets in Redwood Shores, Redwood City, and Foster City. There have been new vendors, though, that have joined the market in the last few weeks. As um, you might have noticed, there's a local Brisbane honey vendor. Uh, Pete Davis is selling honey every other week, and on the um, every other week he's there, but he alternates with Menlo honey. So there's that addition, as, long, as well as a Southeast Asian take on beef and turkey jerky. So there are a um, variety of new vendors being added. However, the $200 per week fee is making it difficult to hold on to vendors when you take into account the wind and the broken tents and the fact that these monthly fees are passed on to the vendors themselves. So Jerry has expressed that if the $200 per week fee were waived, that he would spend that money on producing a couple more banners to hang, and that advertising would be uh, further um, increased to the Crocker Park and Sierra Point uh, parts of town. So foot traffic has kept at a fairly steady level with the weekly shoppers returning rain or shine, and really thank the community for their support. And in the past uh, luminary edition, there was a Moolah Money coupon that was on the back page, and that was to be used at any vendor at the market, and in turn, that would be coming out of Jerry's pocket to increase foot traffic. So that was a marketing tool that he wanted to introduce when he felt that the timing was right, namely when foot traffic was down. And that Moolah dollar is going to also be printed on the front page of the August City News coming out the first week of August. So those are some things that we're doing to try to increase the number of shoppers currently. And also, we were approached by a food truck, Saruno Burger, whose email and menu were attached in your packet. And they wanted to participate in the market on a weekly basis. So I talked to the Public Works Department and Planning Department and police department, and they are fine with the participation of food trucks as long as they're on San Francisco Avenue as opposed to Old County Road. And lastly, the issue of what to do with when the rainy season comes, namely, I guess, in January, March time frame, has been asked of um, the vendors to Jerry. They're concerned with the wind and some of the extreme weather that they've endured out there. And so the idea of using the community center was broached, but we understand that it's being used by a local community organization during the same hours as the market. And so this is also something that can be discussed, um, whether or not this would be a year-round market still or a seasonal market. A lot of markets um, in the peninsula are seasonal, and so that is something to consider. So in terms of fiscal impact, not having that 200 per week fee would result in um, approximately $9,600 less in revenue than would have been collected in a year from West Coast Farmers Market Association. But again, that money that Jerry would be saving would be spent on the advertising through banners and other signage. And in speaking with the city attorney before tonight's meeting, if the council decides to waive the fee that could be done through authorizing the city manager to sign an addendum to his current lease agreement or license agreement, which is due to expire um, six months after it began, so early October. And this fee um, issue could also be revisited at that time as well, if the council would like to. So with that, entertain any questions, and as you can see, Jerry Lamy is here with us as well. Do we have questions for Carol? I don't have a question, but just a comment that uh, people like it. They really enjoy having that uh, farmer's market, and maybe it would be a good idea for us to try that. Wave the fee and see what happens. 
If we can keep them, otherwise <coughs> it's sad if they totally abolished it. I have a question. Um, relates to impact on the park. Um, you know, we've had some experience now, and the question is, you know, has there been an extra maintenance problem uh, because of the farmer's market? Um, you know, is it costing us money uh, uh, to, to take care of uh, additional whatever work would need to be done to the lawn and so forth? No. So that's my question. I have yeah. no idea. Just a question. Yeah. I, it, nothing has been reported to me by, by staff with regards to that. Um, I'll ask that question in our staff meeting this Wednesday, but uh, uh, as far as I know, there has not been any um, any impacts in terms of the maintenance side. Actually, I was thinking along the same lines, and just kind of looked at the park today, and it looked looked, looked pretty good. Uh, you know, I was kind of surprised. I expected to see it a little bit more worn, right. but because uh, you know that was the point of the fee, I think to you know to cover impact. our cost of. You know, additional maintenance that we were thinking might need to be done. Right. I did hear one comment from a resident who was concerned about the kettle pop kettle corn vendor being on the grass as he has that big kettle and they were thinking that might kill the grass that it's under or the grass that's underneath. And so now that vendor is on the sidewalk, if, if you've noticed, and he has a tarp too to protect the area around him. So that issue has been abated through that change of location for him. And the Public Works Department has been very great about um, changing the schedule of the sprinkling of the lawn because it used to be done on Wednesdays and there was a lot of complaints about the grass being wet. A lot of families like to put down picnic blankets and sit on the grass and you know just walking on it. It's you can feel it when you're shopping, and so now the grass is being watered on Tuesday evenings, so it can be absorbed better. And mowed also, um, I believe, on Mondays or Tuesdays, so it doesn't. It's looking nice. You know, I, I, um, it's kind of funny because uh, our worst winds generally are in June and July, <laughs> from perspective of the fog coming in right. you know and it gets a real good push um, Randy left already not that he's the weatherman but <laughs> you know <laughs> but you know we do have some winter storms that you know can be pretty severe sometimes but uh, I, I think from a consistency base uh, wind consistency base is June July is generally the worst but uh, I, when we took on this endeavor, I think one of the things that uh, we talked about is we really wanted to see it be successful. And uh, you know, I'd be willing to waive the fee, you know, and see how this takes off and then, you know, re reinstate it. Certainly, Ray, I, I agree with you that it was more of an impact type fee. Um, Looking at it right now, I mean, it looks like the park is healthy. Maybe maybe a combination of changing the watering, you know, to another day is really going to help. But, uh, you know, the, the lawns look pretty healthy, you know, just maybe that's something to get feedback from the actual maintenance worker because they would really know better. The, the, hmm. the, the, the thing about farmer's market, I know at least I've been truly honest to goodness talking to different vendors in the past five six years to come to Brisbane and none of them wanted to come not because Brisbane was bad because they were busy with other uh, more uh, foot tra areas that had more foot traffic so now that we've gone through the hump in some ways and we have a farmers market we really need to partner and do whatever we can to have this to be successful. And mm -hmm. um, if if it's the time is right, I would love to make a motion to approve the waive waiving of the fee. Okay. Um, I love the farmers market. It's it's something. If I'm in town and able to go, which has been most every week, I go and and um, I've enjoyed it. I love the quality of the food and 
and the availability. Um, I'm just wondering if we waive this fee, is it going to go towards, are the vendors' fees going to get reimbursed? Or are they going to, or is it just all going to be an advertising kick? So uh, my concern is that we might waive the fee and our vendors, the vendors that are here are in the same predicament where they're the ones that need to make their nut and, and cover their costs and make it viable for them to be there and worthwhile to put up with our sometimes inclement weather. So, um, I understood that the fee was to reduce their fees. Am I correct? So this wave that we're giving, it makes it possible for him to reduce right. the vendor's fee. I'm not quite sure I heard that as a direct, direct consequence. So we'll we'll maybe come yeah, up. have him come over. Hey, By the way, Jerry loves being here late at nights. Exactly. I, I get I, I get up so early, you know. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and, and uh, council members, thanks thanks a lot for uh, for hearing me tonight. Yes, uh, Terry, what what I do what I have been doing from the beginning is trying to regulate uh, the the fees to keep people coming back. And so what what I've did, what I've been doing all along out of my own pocket. Um, on, on slower days, on windy days, on on rainy days, is giving anywhere from ten to twenty dollar breaks on 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 the fees. If somebody breaks the tent, I you know I I'll give them twenty bucks off that week, you know, and and the next couple of weeks trying to uh, subsidize them, them going out and getting getting new tents. Um, we we've seen a lot of. Uh, in, the market got off to a huge boom, and probably the only two rainy days I've experienced all year, um, we had rain uh, when we first kicked off the market. Some of the things that have happened, like you know, for hummus, they had an $800 day followed by a 20, uh, t followed by a $1,200 day, and 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 lately they're 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 down anywhere anywhere between three to five hundred dollars a day. Um, a lot of times they'll bring two people. And that'll that'll pay for the gas and the wear and tear on the vehicle, the you know, and, and their their time. So when when sales are down, I I reduce I reduce their booth fees. Um, the same same things. I I've I've lost a couple of tents. I don't, I don't know if you noticed that when I first started, I I put up an information booth tent. I uh, after three weeks, I was. Didn't have any tents, so my son's uh, repairing them right now. But he's learning how to do that. So we're put we're putting new legs on them and things like that. We're learning how to how to fix the ones that we have. But uh, you know the the uh, this is not the only city that we've encountered wind. Um, Redwood Shores. I, I I went out there and on my third week it was pretty windy. So uh, I've I have just recently required acquired the name of uh, they're calling me Chicago. Where, wherever I, I seem to go, the wind seems to follow. But uh, yeah, so so pretty much what we're trying to do. I'm I've I've been uh, juggling different vendors, trying to keep them interested. I've kind of I've gone through uh, four different Asian uh, vegetable farmers. Luckily, I've got an abundance because uh, I, I I run a market in Cupertino, which is has got quite quite a few. Uh, Asian residents there, so I'm I'm able to continue to to uh, to juggle things in and out. This was the second market I've I opened. I've now got five. Um, I've got uh, I've got feelers out for another five or six. I just recently uh, I did an interview in Carmel, and so uh, I'm I'm one of the finalists there to try to run run a market there. We're working with Portola Valley right now uh, with the Web Ranch. Um, I'm going to be opening in September at, at Stanford University and at City College. So that as, as my company continues to grow, we continue to attract new vendors, new farmers. And be, with, with that, I'm sure that we're going to be able to keep, keep people coming back to, to Brisbane. Brisbane, without a doubt, and I'm not just saying this because you guys are here, you've got some of the greatest residents we've ever encountered. The people here really do love the market. They do support it. Um, I just think that you know, we've run into vacation time and travel time and 
there's just there's just not as many people to go around, and so, um, and and as my my vendors grew, I think that you know the 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 portion of the pie um, was divided. You know, when, you know people were doing a little bit better when I had nine and ten vendors. I got up to twenty twenty two vendors because of the reputation of the the wonderful community that you guys have. You know, if we d could find a way to to slow the wind is, winds down, <laughs> what, what, you know what amazes me. Whenever I come to a, a council meeting, it's beautiful outside. <laughs> it, I, I pick the wrong day of the week. Thursday seems uh, seem to be when the winds come. I, I bring the wind, you know. And so so that's that's what's going on. Um, I, you know, I, I've had a couple uh, signs kind of break, and the signs that we put up on the on the board say they run a hundred dollars a piece. So basically, the money would be spread spread around, and we're going to try to get some more banner. We're going to get some more banners made. To to, uh, to continue to try to get some people out here, um, Caroline's been helping. She's on her lunch hour. She's been going after the walking and putting up flyers for me, getting the the, the in, industrial area involved out here. So that's something that uh, I've got to get myself and my my uh, couple of market managers. We want to want to get the businesses involved. If we can get them coming by, um, you know, we I really I went out and I, I reached out to all the all the restaurants. And we, we really, really wanted to get them involved. We wanted them to be able to sell f hot food at the, at, at the park and, and make it a community event. But um, San Mateo County, the, the health department came out, and they look at farmers markets as an event. And because of that, they don't want to put their, their man hours toward, toward coming out and, and, and uh, monitoring farmers markets. They rather do it at certain events. And so we're not allowed to have hot food other than being served in a truck or like a, like a tamale van or something like that. So that, that's where the, uh, the, the question has come in. We've had a couple of trucks that would like to come to the market, but at no time did I want to upset the, the restaurants here in Brisbane. And so that's one, that's one of the reasons that... I wanted to come back to the council and and get your feel for it because I know that um, well my 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 friend my friend friend up at Carol's Meats is not too happy he doesn't want trucks out there you know so you know I just I know that I've got a one on one relationship with him and if he feels that way I feel maybe a lot of the other restaurants might feel that way too because as it is now when people come to the market they probably go back to the restaurants. And so I don't want to start something that would be that would turn turn the community against the market, and and uh, you know so I'm looking, uh, I'm always looking to for an answer that's I'm not sure what really the the right answer is, yeah. and so that's that's why the question came up rather rather than me just go ahead and get, come on in yeah sure you know it, it's one one of the things that I know that uh, Parks and Rec as well as City Council had a very strong feeling about protecting the local restaurants. And so, you know, the, the trucks are able to drive wherever they want. And I have been a restaurant uh, owner in the past. And I know that I, when I couldn't move my, my restaurant around, I wouldn't want a, a truck parking out in front. So that's, that's, that's kind of where the, the money is going to go. It's going to be spread around more into advertising, um, more, more into giving reduced vendor rates to keep, to keep them happy, to keep them coming back. Because if uh, if if I if I was char charging like I, what I charged in the other markets, they would have been gone a long time ago, you know. And it's it's keeping them happy. And I, I think that the weather's getting better, you know. I, I think I think the winds are dying down. At least uh, it's either that or I'm getting used to it, one or the other. <laughs> so that's that's kind of where we're at. Any other questions? But wasn't it? Didn't we have the concert series in <coughs> July or August that the wind was so bad? Which month was it that we changed it a little bit later? Probably July. Yeah, so yeah. July was bad. Yeah, you know, you, I think you're right about that. I think the concerts were pretty chilly. Yeah, it was really <coughs> further in the, in the air. Feast or famine. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, you know, your rationale for, for uh, uh, asking that the $200 fee be waived is, is a good one. You need, I think you need the flexibility. And... and um, you know, some some days, uh, yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna give that discount to your guys because you want to keep them, 
coming to the to the market, and we want the market to to be here for for the citizens. I think, like Sophie right. was saying, you know, like how do you partner? I mean, is well, is really you know providing a service to the community. Right, but it's been a very good experience for your son to learn to put up tents <laughs> in the storm in the wind. So, yeah. exactly. so uh, you know, I think that you know this is a two part you know thing for us. And, right? like, and so, what, what do you guys all think about the the food? Track. Food trucks, for me, I, I, I'm in San Francisco a lot, and I see the food trucks that are mobile, and they create their own buzz. They create people pulling off um, or seeking out a food truck with a good reputation. I've seen the food trucks that are out here at um, Zero, Point. Zero Point, and there's people that... Twitter, what trucks are there, and if it's a good truck or a truck with a following, people pull off from, you know, 20 mi 10 miles away. They will come for these trucks. So while I understand that some of the restaurants may feel threatened by the business, and it could work out that way, I, I don't know, um, I think that it also could bring... And, and I don't think it's one food truck that necessarily is going to be something that would cause a draw, but it, if it's, you know, a little food truck, a couple of them, people actually will get off the freeway to, because they'll know that food truck's there. Now, getting the really popular food trucks to come here on a Thursday afternoon, I don't know what kind of how difficult that would be to, to convince them that this is a good spot to be. Um, and I would think that we wouldn't want to get a Mexican food truck. Because we've got a couple, yeah. Because we have Mexican restaurants in town that... Well, that, that was kind of my uh, my idea is, is, is uh, thinking is that you don't want to get a type of food truck that's in competition with the restaurants, that it has a different menu. And I think we should be very limited in what we allow because they suck up parking. And, you know, people want to get pretty much as close as possible. Right in front. When, when, <laughs> yeah, I mean, when they, when they come from, you know, work or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, they, if they're going to do some shopping, they're going to do their walking around doing the shopping and stuff like that, and they have a bunch of stuff. They don't want to carry, you know half a mile or two miles <laughs> and and would there be Maybe cliff does but you know would there be any um possibility of of using like the where the post office is but i mean i guess if it's three to five that's a difficult time if they put the trucks there um no you'd you'd want to put it right next to the park there i mean i take the police you know, just kind of thinking of a, a, a place, you know, we have one San Bruno that has that open uh, sidewalk. You know, maybe if there, the food truck was there, and then I don't know if it's possible to put out some tables and chairs. I mean, you, then people could, if we decide to go with this vendor, they could get a burger and fries and, and then go sit down, and, and it could be kind of a little cafe thing. You know, just like you're talking about, like creating that, that little buzz. You know, that makes it, you know, kind of unique. Just throwing it out there as a possibility. You know, I mean, I, you know, whatever we can do to kind of just make it more of a cool thing. I think it's it's, it's 1028. Maybe we need to let them come up with their plans. Are we for a food truck or not? If we are, let them deal with it and come up with a suggestion. It's 1030. I hear it. We're just, you know, kind of, you know, brainstorming here about whether or not this is something that we think is good. Well, I think so. we should limit it to two maximum right now if, if, we, if we allow it and, and that we should have a different uh, that it shouldn't be necessarily having the same type of menu of what some of our restaurants do. Now that limits it. Mm. Like this Serrano burger is different than anything that we have. Yeah, we haven't had a burger place Well, I mean, it's a, a long time. different burger, mm -hmm. you know, different types, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I'd be Clark, prepared to support, you, you know, experimentation of the truck thing, but I agree with Clark. Include me in your uh, I think we should limit the number of trucks. 
because those food trucks sort of create their own culture, as Terry was saying, and uh, they can take over a whole area. I know they, they do this thing in San Francisco where they take over a whole parking lot, and it's a whole community, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what, what happened to the farmer's market? <laughs> you know, so there is that problem of proportionality. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get overwhelmed by the, the food truck uh, kind of thing. But if it would help bring people in and then they would also go over and buy stuff from the farmer's market, well, then it's good. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can do, you know, sort of experiment with a couple and see how it goes. And I've, I've watched... Um a couple of food trucks were divided to Portola Valley, and it was just it was one to begin with, and then they brought in a second one, and it was just Twitter alone. And I got I got out there at 5:30 just to watch what would happen, just with Twitter, and the parking lot filled up within 45 minutes, and it was something that uh, they they decided to uh, it became a fundraiser for the local church. And so from that, city council approached me to bring, a, to bring a farmer's market to Portola Valley, which doesn't have one yet. So because of the local grocer there, we're still trying to figure out exactly where it's going to be. You know, and, but uh, I, I believe that if we limit it to, to, say, two trucks at a time, we don't compete with local restaurants. And I check in with Caroline and, 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 and let her know who's coming in advance we can, you know, we can let people know what's, you know, what's going to be coming out here, and we can try to rotate some in and some out, and and we can do it on a te test basis again. I mean, you know, and the reason that I was asking the question is I don't want to offend anybody, and food trucks, uh, I tried them at uh, San Jose City College, but we went in on a Friday when there were there weren't enough students there. The only one I offended, I had the, the lady that ran the cafeteria wanted to string me up, but uh, I have permission from the college to, to do it, so I'm still here to talk to you. <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, Clark's suggestion of the two trucks with uh, non-competing um, yeah. Restaurants is uh, no, I'm competing menus. I mean, uh, not competing with menus. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, right. bring some Persian food. There is no Persian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have an Indian restaurant. Yeah. There's a lot out yeah. there. They exist. Yep. I've seen them. Yep. <laughs> they do. Yep. That's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
close that window. And what's in season? I mean, what you can get right. and what's going to really be mm -hmm. right. viable in the winter. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all your hard work. Man. You, you, you've, you've been an asset to the community. Thanks. You know, you know, I do want to bring up that uh, I think there's, Seppi, you may know her, Christine Dunn. Yeah. Yeah, sent out this email, all this farmer markets, all over the place except for Brisbane. And uh, so I wrote back to her and said, hey, you left Brisbane off the list. And he goes, oh, you guys don't have a Samtran stop. I go, we're right in between the Samtran stop, you know, two of them. Yep. And the market, and right across the street is the uh, Peninsula Traffic Congestion Relief Alliance. And she says, oh, thanks for your feedback. Uh, we put this out only once a year. <laughs> and that's why, I truly, I've been pushing. You're frustrating. I, I'm really <laughs> upset with some of the treatment. I really do. I'd be, just the fact that we, you, might, you, might, you guys might get really upset at me, but just the fact that we don't have the train station named after Brisbane, that is, totally minimizes us really does, as if we don't exist. Bayshore Station. Clay, right? I'm just trying to get a motion on what you're Oh, I'm sorry. I made a motion, yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> to waive the fee and to allow uh, the food trucks based on the... You know, I'm even willing to, to uh, say, trucks and, and, you know, uh, maybe let it make it three. Maybe one of the truck could be ice cream, one, you know. Uh, you know, I think if there's, you know, if there are, see, yeah, let's you know. see what they can bring. We, we don't want to have a parking lot, the whole city get filled with 20, 30, but two or three, let's see what they come. Uh, what was your motion, two? I'm going to go not to exceed three. <laughs> what? Not to exceed three. Hmm. How about that? It, it doesn't matter to me. Huh? If there's concern is that good? about the extra truck. Is there a concern with extra truck? Even if you go up to five? Well, I'm concerned I more. It, it's the more trucks you put, is, is you're chewing up parking and, and then... So, but you know, let's see. Let's just give the max that we can, but we're not going over it. Just to Allah so he doesn't have to come back here for another two-hour discussion. <laughs> two. Yeah, I mean, this has been a long discussion about this. Right. Except it really right. has. All right. Okay. So I'm making a motion to waive the fee and allow not to exceed five. But that's just a cap. All right. I don't know. Well, no, five's too many. I don't even so how many? Ray, I'm willing to. Two? You still want to go with two? Ray, can you break the tie? <laughs> um, <laughs> I could go for three. Okay. I wouldn't go more than that. Okay. Let's go. So I make my amend my motion to waive the fee and not to exceed three trucks. Okay. So second, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. How about you, Clark? All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> All those against? <laughs> Are you going to talk about it? No. No. Oh, no I'm just yeah. voting against it. That's all. No. I think it's too many. That's all. I mean, okay. really, really. So, no, no. I got two no's yeah. and I got the three yeses. Okay. Okay. All right. Who's the two? I voted no. Right. Mm. Okay. Clark. I mean, uh, sorry, Clark and Clark uh, okay. and Terry. Terry. Ray <laughs> second. All right. Okay. Um, it's ten thirty-six. Um, I'm gonna motion to okay. extend the meeting for. We should take a break too. Ah, uh, we will do that. Yeah. Can we just get that motion though? So we got the motion till eleven o'clock. Yeah, I guess. Okay. So. Second? No sure. second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's take a quick break and we'll come on back. Actually, I thought we were going to make it through before 1030. I'm looking. I, yeah, we're we're, we're clicking. Where's Jerry, man? <laughs> <laughs> he loves his job.